Hello, welcome back everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I hope you are safe and you're well and you are joining us with the same enthusiasm and excitement as yesterday. Welcome to the second part of the interactive virtual roundtable featuring ministers responsible for youth, representatives from partner organizations and young people themselves. My name is Jatma Vikramanayake and I am the United Nations Secretary General's Envoy on Youth. Me and my office, we are one of the co-organizers of this forum. So I'm so glad that all of you are here. Yesterday, in the first part of this session, we welcomed more than 60 speakers for a jam-packed three and a half hours in which we started discussions on the active role of young people in building back from COVID-19 towards more inclusive societies. We also launched the first Youth 2030 Progress Report on the implementation of the UN's first ever youth strategy. So if you haven't already checked it out, please go to the website and and check that out. There's a lot of interesting information there. Now, yesterday we covered a number of SDGs. Uh, we covered SDG 1, SDG 2, SDG 3, SDG 8, SDG 12. And today we are going to cover SDG 13 on climate action, SDG 16 on peaceful, just and inclusive societies, and SDG 17 on partnerships. Same rules apply today because we have so many speakers lined up. We ask for your kind understanding in applying the strict time limits on all interventions, both pre-recorded and live. We are truly delighted about the record number of high-level speakers and youth representatives this year. But in order to ensure that everyone is given an opportunity to deliver remarks in a limited time that we have on this virtual platform, we would have to limit or cut off your interventions uh, as communicated before to this forum. So please do stick to the time limitations that was previously agreed. All of your interventions, uh, both re recorded statements and written statements, could be accessible through the Ecosoc Youth Forum website later. So don't worry if you didn't manage to express all your ideas and feelings and comments during this very limited time. Don't forget to also check out the social media accounts. Yesterday, we had a stream of inputs coming from social media, from young people particularly, and also some of you policymakers. On Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, use hashtag youth2030 and at youth and at you and youth envoy social media accounts when you do let us know what your thoughts and ideas are on these particular sdgs and also broadly on youth engagement in the sdgs so now without further ado let's begin with the first sdg we are going to discuss today SDG 13 on climate change every friday most of you will look out of your windows and especially before the COVID-19 pandemic, you would see many young people on the streets demanding for climate action. Um, not just on the streets, I think in their villages, in their communities, in their schools, young people have been driving the climate movement, demanding urgent action from leaders. Are you one of those climate leaders? Let us know in the chat box. Let us know in the Q&A section of the Teams event and on social media. But now let me pass on the floor to one such inspiring climate activist, Davis Rubin from Fridays for Future, Uganda. Davis, the floor is yours. Hi. I'm not here to tell you what you know, but rather what we need to do about climate change. Climate action is central to achieving other sustainable development goals. Zero hunger, good health and well-being cannot be achieved when there are people who are suffering from droughts and heat strokes as a result of the high temperatures. I was saddened received news about the unprecedented floods in Australia, Vietnam, and Cambodia, all due to extreme rainfall and tropical storms. In my country, Uganda, the climate crisis is a daily reality. We have experienced extreme weather events causing floods, landslides, and droughts. Many lives have been lost, homes destroyed, and futures taken away. Climate change is real. The energy sector contributes to two-thirds or the greenhouse gases. We should not forget that a clean energy transition for all will lead to a reduction of the CO2 emissions, a 
and reliance on fossil fuels. Governments must stop all new investments in coal, oil, and gas to build resilient and sustainable communities we need increased investments and incentives in development of cleaner energy to make it affordable even to the low income earning communities. There is a crying need for system change that should be addressed. Fellow Earth citizens, climate change is a disease that is eating away our planet brick by brick. Leaders must get out of the comfort zone and face the climate emergency. Global cooperation is needed in this fight. The countries that are being impacted right now are the least responsible for the climate crisis, and they lack the resources needed to fully address this crisis. This is why every community, every country must be included in achieving climate justice. It is only justice if the most affected people and their places are not left behind. Women leadership and inclusion should not be ignored. Girls and women are disproportionately affected by climate change. This is why they must be in those rooms where decisions concerning our lives and our planets are made. We all must unite behind the science in order to tackle the climate crisis. History is waiting to judge whether this was the generation of leadership that stopped the destruction of the planet or looked on as Earth was being torn apart. I hope that we will choose the form. Thank you. Thank you very much, Davis. Thank you for speaking truth to power and also the work that you and the Fridays for Future movement has been doing in the past years to hold decision makers accountable. I'm sure your voice was heard loud and clear today. And I hope that the ministers who are in this room and others who are responsible, particularly the corporations that David was talking about, does take these matters into action and do implement the commitments they have made. Thank you. And with that, let me move on to the Minister of Youth and Sports and Community Development of the Maldives. Minister, the floor is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum. Uh, more than a year after the outbreak of COVID-19, the world is still struggling to respond to and recover from the pandemic's multidimensional challenges. In Maldives, the livelihoods of thousands of young people employed in various sectors, namely the tourism industry and related services, were disrupted. They are currently navigating the loss of income, access to healthcare, social isolation and exclusion with disruptions to education and training. These challenges threaten to unravel the progress made towards achieving the SDGs with and for youth. Excellencies, the government of President Ibrahim Mohamed Soli has placed young people and sustainability at the center of its development policy. To help address the socio-economic impact of the crisis, the government of Maldives developed a relief package worth 2.9% of, of our GDP, including financing facilities for businesses and households in the tourism and fishery sectors and social protection measures for vulnerable communities. The government is also drafting a youth bill to promote and protect young people's rights and including increasing youth representation in decision making. Excellencies, we welcome the key role that young people in tackling climate change and raising ambition of governments on climate action in, in the lead up to COP26 in Glasgow. Indeed, young scientists and engineers have been advancing climate smart technologies and pioneering more sustainable infrastructure solutions across the globe, which have far reaching co-benefits across all SDGs. The Maldives remains committed to a youth-led implementation of 2030 agenda and supports the United Nations Youth Strategy 2030 while building back better from the pandemic's lingering effects. We need more partnership to re reorient our economies towards a more resilient and sustainable model that effectively engages young people along the chain of prevention, preparedness, response and recovery from future challenges. We join all of you on this collective aspiration for achieving more inclusive, fair and resilient communities. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Minister. And also a country that is affected deeply by climate change. We are really excited to see the efforts you are making to include young people in decision making related to climate action. Thank you for, for your work. With that, let me move to the government of Italy, the Minister of Youth, Minister for Youth Policies of Italy. The floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. I am very pleased to participate in this meeting of the ECOSOC Youth Forum that celebrates its 10th anniversary. The COVID pandemic has disrupted every aspect of our lives, especially the lives of young people. It has imposed strong limitations on autonomy and sociality by reducing the spaces for participation and encounter Young people are perhaps the group most severely hit by the containment measures. In addition, the pandemic has increased inequalities. Participation is the main objective of the European Youth Strategy 2019-2027, to which the youth policies of the Italian government are inspired. It is fundamental that young people are involved and meaningfully consulted in relation to policies that affect them. This is why Italy, which this year took over the presidency of the G20 and the co-presidency of COP26, has created ad hoc youth participation spaces, the Y20 summit to be held in Milan in July, will allow young people to entrust to the leaders of the G20 their recommendations on sustainability, climate change, innovation, digitization, and inclusion. In September, Youth for Climate, Driving Ambition is the second important event on climate change dedicated to youth. 400 young people coming from the 197 countries that have ratified the UN Convention on Climate Change will have the opportunity to draw up concrete proposals for the pre-COP26 of Milan and the COP26 of Glasgow. At the national level, in order to create spaces for youth participation and a dialogue with policymakers, we are developing an interactive web platform called Youth 2030. The name originates from the 2030 Agenda for sustainable development. The platform also responds to the right of young people to have access to accurate and objective information that meets their needs and questions. Last but not least, Italian youth organizations are proving to be important players in making proposals for the recovery and resilience plan. I promise you that we will do everything we can so that our young people will not be disappointed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. There is also a lot of action happening in the chat. And we have, for an example, Sakshi Krishna from India saying that I have started a climate action initiative called My Earth in India to spotlight the impact of climate change on the lives of indigenous people. And looks like through this program, they are hoping to bust all barriers for the community stereotypes of women being at the forefront of any change in society. Congratulations, Sakshi. Please keep doing your important work and please also keep sending us the progress of your work and the challenges and barriers as well so that we can make sure that the policymakers in this discussion are aware of those and take action to support you and help you in your work. With that, let me now invite the Minister of Youth and Sports of Sudan to take the floor. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ayyuha al-Sada wuzara al-Shabaab bidwala al-Alim Kafa. Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, allow me first of all to congratulate youth around the world uh, for this opportunity to participate in this forum. We wish that these efforts continue and their effective contribution to 
address the challenges facing young people. Ladies and gentlemen, ministers, today I represent a new Sudan following one of the most greatest and most noble revolutions of modern times. The young people of Sudan, young men and women, have made success, uh, reached a success that will go down in history with will and sacrifice and determination to put an end to an atrocious dictatorship. And they did it with a, in a peaceful manner with a message whereby peace and efforts for peace are the best ways of building a community. This revolution has bestowed upon us a great responsibility too to address the problems faced by young people. This is why we believe the SDGs are an excellent foundation to ensure that young people can participate uh, in reform efforts, institutional reform, for example, and reform on young people's rights to enact those laws that would allow that would empower young people and guarantee their rights, creating statutes and policies and structures uh, in order to strengthen the role of young people so that they have a seat at the table for decision making. We're now in the transitional, during the transition area, we attach great importance to young people and we made, we spared no effort to ensure participation of young people as observers and partners so that they can then be leaders in this traditional phase towards democracy. And this has been done through our youth parliament. Uh, we've restructured our youth centres to, to take care of curricula too. The aim also is to fight poverty. And the speech has has been cut off. Thank you very much, Minister. So now we move on to the next SDG with that, SDG 16. And I think it's clear that the sustainable recovery from the pandemic requires rethinking governance, building bridges, and building divides between and strengthening the social contract between institutions, including the United Nations and people. Because more than ever, it's clear that young people around the world are demanding accountability, transparency, democracy, and participation. So now to kick us off on SDG 16, it's my greatest pleasure to invite another one of our youth speakers, Ms. Rami Saha Ijaz, who is a disability rights activist from Pakistan. Rami Saha, the floor is yours. I think we are having a difficulty in um, receiving your feed, Ramesa. Probably your connection is not that strong. Maybe colleagues can... Um, try to figure out what the problem is on the back end. And until then, let me invite the next speaker, the Minister of Youth of the Dominican Republic. The Dominican Republic led the way in the Security Council during their term for the adoption of the Security Council Resolution 2535. So I'm very excited to invite the minister now to speak about the topic of SDG 16 and youth involvement. Minister, the floor is yours. Muy buenas tardes, estimados ministros. Good afternoon, distinguished ministers and other leaders who are with us today. In the Ministry of Youth for the Republic, uh, the Dominican Republic, it is an honor for us to work with you and to increase our efforts in the area of public policies to benefit one of the most diverse age groups, namely our youth. We understand that in the midst of a pandemic, an effective institutional response is needed to address the issues facing our youth, but from a human rights perspective, in order to save many lives and also to bring us closer to the SDGs. And that is why in the government we are working hard on reducing the flows of illicit weapons and consolidating 
youth participation with particular emphasis on the most vulnerable sectors in our society, guaranteeing access to quality education and to public programs to ensure social justice, which will then lead to a reduction in rates of violence and an increase of opportunities. We have an opportunity to build more peaceful and safer societies and also to provide opportunities to guarantee justice and to ensure dignified development and youth inclusion in all spheres of society. We are building the tools for local policies and we wish you every success. We're ready to go the extra mile whenever necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Next, I am honored to give the floor to another big supporter of the youth agenda, politically, financially, and in, in many ways. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome the Minister of International Development and the Youth Delegate of Human Rights from Norway. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Yayatma, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, youth Delegates uh, and Ministers, COVID-19 COVID has fueled geopolitical uh, friction and young people are disproportionately affected by conflict and crisis. Thus, it should be obvious that youth are given a crucial role in preventing conflict and building sustainable peace. Youth involvement is, is, involvement is not about ticking boxes or to put a group of young people on the stage in the beginning or in the end of a conference. You really need to foster meaningful dialogue and partnerships between young people and other stakeholders. So therefore, it is key for Norway to work for youth participation and in close dialogue with youth-led youth organizations and to facilitate for, for an active civil society role also. So um, I, for my part, found it very useful when I met with Norwegian youth organizations in our common preparations of this uh, very forum. The pandemic has shown that we need the leadership of youth more than ever. And you are not leaders of tomorrow. I would like to say that you are the most important voice today. And I'm thus more than pleased to share my speaking time with one of Norway's youth delegates to this forum, Sandra Schiake from the Norwegian Children and Youth Council. So, Madam Chair, if you please allow me to pass on the word to Sandra, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Madam Chair, Ministers and Youth Delegates. My name is Sandra, and I'm talking to you as a youth delegate from Norway. First, I want to address the importance of including youth in the work with the SDG 16, Peace, Justice and Inclusive Institutions. Youth are the ones who will assume the responsibility of the agreements that are being signed. Therefore, we need to keep working on meaningful youth participation and accommodate for youth to organize. The work should be done by continuing the important work on Resolution 2215 on youth, peace and security. Secondly, the COVID-19 pandemic is much more than just a health crisis. The pandemic has forced more than 1.6 billion youth out of school, many that will never return. The pandemic also inflicts a heavy toll on young workers, ending their employment and impairing their career prospects. Lastly, COVID-19 pandemic is linked to the three planetary crises of our own making, the climate crisis, the nature crisis, and the pollution and waste crisis. I encourage decision makers to scale up your NDCs while also focusing climate finance on adoption. The recovery from COVID-19 has to be sustainable, green, and equitable to the needs of the younger generations in order to ensure a sustainable future without insecurity and without conflict. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra, for those very valuable inputs and especially calling for the inclusion of young people in the NDCs of national governments and all of those young people who are watching us. If you don't know what the NDCs are, they are the nationally determined contributions of your governments and they are they must be working on them right now. So reach out and try to get involved and make sure that your voices are being heard. Also by uh, Norway's seat in the Security Council for the next two years, we hope that Norway will continue to champion this agenda for years to come. With that, let me now pass on the floor to another champion of the Youth Peace and Security Agenda, the architects really behind the Resolution 2250 that Sandra referred to, the Government of Jordan. The Minister of Youth, the Government of Jordan, the floor is yours. Excellency, is good day. I was advised to address SDG 16, 
peace, justice, and strong institutions in my intervention today and coming from Jordan, I believe this topic is essential. To start with, I would like to invest this opportunity by inviting all attendees to once again remember the Amman message, which is His Majesty's King Abdullah II's statement to call for tolerance and unity. It clarifies the true nature and image of Islam. I would also like to remind all attendees of the historical UN Security Council's resolution 2250, Youth, Peace and Security, a tremendous effort that was led by His Royal Highness Crown Prince Al Hussein bin Abdullah. It redefines the role of youth in achieving peace and it sets general guidelines upon which policies and programs should be developed. The SDG 16's title consists of three parts, the first being peace, which is our core value at the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. We believe in achieving peace, and our diplomatic efforts in all the past years focused on achieving peace in all places, states, and regions. We in the Middle East know how important and vital achieving peace is, and it cannot be achieved without solving the Palestinian issue, which is a central issue for Jordan and its Arab counterparts. Our only way to achieve a fair and just solution is through peaceful dialogue that leads to the establishment of a sovereign Palestinian state ruled and governed democratically by the Palestinians and according to all the UN resolutions concerning Palestine. Regarding justice, we in Jordan are asking the question of justice on multiple occasions and fronts. Lately, during the COVID-19 pandemic, justice was not present. Jordan, among other countries, and as a country with limited resources, has had a very troubling path in ensuring that Jordanians are getting vaccines. Justice should be manifested during the most difficult times and circumstances, especially now in providing fair amounts of vaccines. Thank you very much, Minister, for your intervention. Let me see if we can bring back our youth representative now, Ms. Rami Saha Iljas from Pakistan. Rami Saha is a disability rights activist. And let's hope that we can connect her this time. Yes, there she is. The floor is yours. Hello, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, we, young people with disabilities, belong to one of the most marginalized communities in the world. We're often denied the most basic rights, including the right to education, right to equal participation, and even the right to life. Being a young woman with an invisible disability, I've been bullied, harassed, questioned, and even electrocuted as a mayor to correct my mind. Throughout my life, Unfortunately, I think we are losing Rami Saha again. Let's let's try to connect her back. But I think this is a really good reflection of the challenges that young people around the world are facing in terms of accessing digital platforms. Um, even though we say that the digital uh, virtual nature of events have increased access, it can be really challenging for some of us. Yes, there she is. We got you back, Rami Saha. Sorry. Go ahead. In November 2020, we were finally given a chance to voice our concerns and lift challenges as young people with disabilities with the help of the UN Youth Envoys Office, along with other parties who organized the Global Youth Consultation. Consequently, the main demand that was put forward was to provide us with a platform. The SDG 16 talks about inclusive institutions and the need to ensure responsive, inclusive, participatory, and representative decision-making at all levels. Inclusive participation 
and input from young people with disabilities will lead to the UN becoming a much stronger institute, as well as bringing about more justice in the society for youth with disabilities who are often overlooked. The COVID-19 and lockdown measures across the globe have widened the gap of accessibility and inclusion for youth with disabilities. State parties and intergovernmental agencies must ensure the right of technology as a human right, the right to legal capacity and political participation for youth with disabilities in order to ensure effective implementation of SDG 16. We must be included in all policy making spaces with dedicated accessible platforms within all intergovernmental systems and within all UN agencies. We need a platform to express our concerns as youth with disabilities and to scale inclusive participation to involve youth with disabilities who might otherwise not get such opportunities. We youth with disabilities request all ministries present to take this message back to your countries and ensure full and effective participation of youth with disabilities. We hope that the state parties and UN agencies will everywhere and always allow for the voice of young people with disabilities to be heard and to fulfill the promise of leaving no one behind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rami Saha. Even with the technological challenges, I think your intervention was so precise. Your demands and your asks were very clear. And certainly this has been heard by the UN and I'm sure that this was heard by the many ministers who are joining this round table and this event today as well. Thank you for your work. With that, let me now pass the floor to the Minister of Culture and Sport of Qatar and the Youth Delegate of Qatar. أصحاب السعادة السيدات والسادة المحترمين يسرني أن أشارككم اليوم في Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor for me today to participate in this very important debate. I would like to thank all the ministers for their vital contributions. The state of Qatar attaches major importance to youth organizations and the promotion of their participation in sustainable development because we are convinced that young people have the potential to make positive change and to promote societies. The state of Qatar is deeply convinced that sustainable development requires peaceful societies where respect is primordial. My country has committed to support efforts to implement SDG 16 around the world through our participation with Finland, Colombia and the United Nations to prepare the first conference on youth participation in peace processes. The conference was held in 2019 in Helsinki and led to a political document with 17 important recommendations on strengthening youth participation in peace processes. We attach particular importance to this issue because the wise leadership of Qatar believes in the role of young people to support and spread peace. And in order to do that, we must allow young people to participate in development processes on all levels. We are looking forward to an international high-level conference on youth participation in peace processes, and this will help be held in Doha in 2022. I'd like to give the floor to Ms. Munira Al-Bakir, Youth Delegate of Qatar from the Education Above All Foundation, to provide you with some information on this conference. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Munir al Kera from the state of Qatar. I'm a youth delegate uh, from the delegation Youth Above All, who, work, who works for young people's education for marginalised youth. And His Majesty bin Nasser Ali recalled that we need to bring together the required conditions to provide hope for young people. Um, because they are indeed the driver of positive change in societies. Also, this conference will be a turning point. We're allowed to focus on political engagement on a national level and ensuring that the requirements are met to ensure peace processes include young people, as well as increasing women's participation and supporting gender equality. We, you, the youth, really do appreciate this opportunity to have our voices heard and we'd invite young people around the world to participate in this conference. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister, and to the Youth Delegate. We really look forward to the conference in Doha next year um, and also supporting the government of Qatar, Finland and Colombia in the 
inclusion of youth in the peace processes or peace negotiations around the world. And my office stands ready to support all these efforts going forward. I'm looking at the uh, the chat and we have a lot of interesting ideas being shared, but particularly one that's interesting is from Vera Almalva. Vera is talking about the importance of uh, art and culture in peace building, quite similar to what the minister was also talking about. And she talks about how important it is to include art for nonviolent communication, leadership, coexistence, and citizenship. And she also calls for the youth in marginalized areas to be given opportunities to contribute through short films, photographs, and artworks dedicated to peace building and countering violence through the UN's platforms to help them give a voice. Thank you very much, Vera, for your recommendation. And rest assured, this will be taken into account. With that, now let me give the floor to one of our key partners. Mm. We worked very closely in the past years on matters pertaining to young people's political participation. And most recently, we launched a joint call to action with concrete recommendations as to how to increase the number of young women running for political office. We will share those links for the call to action with you. But for now, please join me in welcoming Mr. Melvin Bua, the president of the Interparliamentary Unions Forum of Young Parliamentarians and a member of Parliament of Suriname. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, greetings to uh, the dear ministers, uh, their colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to join you as president of the IPU Forum of Young Parliamentarians. The IPU um, is the Global Organization of Parliaments. Our Forum of Young Parliamentarians is the institutional body and the place where young members of parliaments below the age of 45 around the world meet. As we celebrate this event's 10th anniversary, we are dealing with multiple global crises. Now, more than ever, we need political institutions that are inclusive, accountable, and effective. This is what the SDG 16 is all about. This is also what parliaments are all about. As representative of the people, we parliaments adopt the laws, need to uh, bring SDGs to reality. We hold governments to account. We channel the voices, voices of the people in all our work. Being young member of parliament is not an easy task, as we are just over 2% of the world's MPs. In many cases, it is really challenging. As we promote advancement toward achieving the SDG 16, these low proportions of youth in Parliament are simply not ideal when we talk about uh, that we need to promote inclusiveness and participation for development. Empowering youth institutions is not only the right thing to do, but it is also the smart thing to do, the smart thing to tackle in the challenges that we face. Therefore, it is very important that we need to work towards the enabling of young people, young potentials, uh, empowering young leaders, young MPs in several leadership roles. We call for parliaments to be gender sensitive and to fit the life cycle that needs that we need as young people. Although young people are, are underrepresented in parliaments, young women in particular face double discrimination less than 1% of world's MPs are under the age of 30. To address this, we recently teamed up with the UN Envoy on Youth to promote and support young women's participation. Our joint call to action was launched this month, last month. In addition to the ECOSOC forum, uh, Forum's 10 years anniversary and the 2020 in 2020, we also celebrated 10 years of IPU's work to empower youth. Let's enter this decade together, the coming decade, and level up our co 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 collaboration so that we bring these solutions to life. I thank you and fish, wish you very luck. Thank you very much, Honourable Member of Parliament. With that inspiring message, let me pass the floor to the Minister of Youth and Sport of Egypt. Minister, the floor is yours.
Distinguished ministers and delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor and pleasure to be virtually speaking to you. I look forward to the day we all gather in person soon as a pandemic settles. However, realistically, the limitations and challenges of this pandemic has challenges, has presented challenges in sustainably developing our nations. The Ministry of Youth and Sports of Egypt and Egypt's national youth strategy has to develop and involve to ensure that the youth, which is one of the most valuable assets in Egypt, is empowered, interconnected, and accomplished, especially after the pandemic. Accordingly, I have overseen over 140 programs for youth, with additional 140 programs to be implemented by the end of this year. This program tackles all 17 goals of the global agenda with specific focus on SDG 16, a program that I would like to specifically achieve the spotlight on safe space, which is in cooperation with UNFPA Egypt. It is focused on delivering young uh, migrants and young people with uh, disabilities, their human rights to be economically and so socially integrates into our nations. The program, this program aims to raise awareness of productive health, psychological support, and provide vocational training courses. This project falls in accordance with sustainable development target 3.7, 5.1, and 10.2. Finally, we have with our efforts to provide the use as the largest segments of the Egyptian society. A platform to be included in the dialogues on sustainable development, the Ministry of Youth and Sports update the national strategy for youth and uh, adults for the next five years. This update is inclusive of youth in various governance, ensure diversity of backgrounds and that no one is left behind. These steps were taken in accordance with the UN Secretary General's strategy on youth 2030. His Excellency President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi works as sincerely to achieve the global goals and the leadership is keen on caring for the youth and raising, raising their level of cultural awareness I included by emphasizing, emphasizing that Egypt will make every effort to enhance that rule, the rules of youth and work toward the Egypt 2030 strategy and strive for just and sound societies. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much, you very Minister, much, for, your Minister for your intervention. Now let me now pass let the me floor pass to the, the Minister of Education of Peru. Do we have Peru online? Muy buenas tardes con... Good afternoon, everyone. Greetings from Peru. It is an honor for us to participate in this international forum, and we're very grateful for the invitation. As you know, Peru is going through a particular political process in our transition government, and we've been doing that for some months now. However, this has not limited the efforts by the Ministry of Education, to which the National Youth Secretariat uh, reports. We need to strengthen our institutions and ensure institutional reform for our youth. We have two key objectives. The first is to see the issue of youth as a public policy. This is not just one of the activities of our sector, but it is a priority matter for discussion. And these decisions which we are taking 
can clearly become public policies. And the second approach we are taking has to do with the institutional architecture and how it impacts our youth, namely as they face uh, severe inequalities. They represent 25% of our population and they don't have the same opportunities. And these inequalities at which initially were vertical are now horizontal inequalities, inequalities across the board. Youth were seen as a homogeneous group, but now there are great gaps within that group. There are differences between the urban and rural youth, but also differences within urban areas and differences within rural areas. In the Ministry of Education and in the National Youth Secretariat, we hope that the incoming government, which will begin its work in July, we hope to give them a National Youth Secretariat, which is much stronger and which has put our youth on our agenda of public policies as a priority. Thank you very much and thank you very much for holding this forum. Thank you, Minister, for sharing with us what you are doing in Peru. Now, we're jumping on to the next SDG, the SDG on partnerships. Um, in every statement from the beginning of this segment yesterday, partnerships were discussed. That's because without partnerships, we cannot really achieve any of the SDGs that we were talking about. So without further ado, I want to give the floor to someone, a young leader who is showing the way in her community and in the global stage when it comes to forging partnerships, not only to support her school, but also to support the young people in her community. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Asil Sabo. Asil is a UNRWA, if not the United Nations Relief in the Near East, that's the long term of UNRWA. And UNRWA has a student parliament for the students who are going to the UNRWA schools. And Azil is one of those student parliamentarians. I'm so honored to give the floor to Azil now. Excellencies, fellow youth, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Asya Sabah. I am a 17-year-old Palestine refugee from Lebanon. I study in one of the schools operated by the United Nations Agency for Palestine Refugees, UNRWA. My peers elected me as a member of the first ever UNRWA agency-wide student parliament. The UNRWA parliament represents over half a million Palestine refugee girls and boys studying in UNRWA schools in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Gaza, and the West Bank. Partnerships under SDG 17 are the glue for the successful implementation of all SDGs, and young people can be the glue of society. They can connect all the new and contribute ideas and energy to societies. Youth-led and youth-focused organizations like our UNRWA Youth Parliaments have a lot to contribute with when it comes to partnerships. UNRWA school parliaments are an example of a democratic practice, organization, and representation. Elected representatives engage together across borders, conflicts, and blockades to connect young Palestine refugee, refugees in different countries. However, connecting youth with each other and with decision makers from different parts of the world requires giving them access to technology. All young people have to have access to internet and devices to be able to contribute, engage, innovate. 90% of young people live in developing countries. They should not be left behind. COVID-19 gave the world a huge lesson in how everyone matters. It is a huge reminder that the world is connected and we all play a role in making it better. I am lucky to be a part of an organization that encourages youth to participate and be involved in decision making. I'm grateful to the UN for giving me the chance to speak, but I'm wondering how many voices are still waiting to be heard. After all, our future depends on the successful implementation of all SDGs. Young people are the key to the realization of the SDGs. As a representative of Palestine refugee youth, my message for you is that we want to contribute to change. Like young people everywhere, young Palestine refugees, 
are like all young men and women, are change makers. We too are the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asiel. Um, for you and the work that your friends at the Student Parliament are doing and my visit to Palestine two years ago and meeting many of your fellow youth student parliamentarians in the West Bank and Gaza remains one of the highlights of my time as the Youth Envoy of the UN. And I want to congratulate you for all the work that you are doing. Uh, now, let's move on to our next speaker, which is the Vice Minister of Youth of the Ministry of Culture and Youth of Costa Rica. Excellency, the floor is yours. Do we have Costa Rica online? Hola, buenas tardes, distinguidas. Hello, good afternoon, distinguished delegates. In Costa Rica, our youth represent 40% of the population and they face many inequalities. In order to tackle these challenges, since 2002, we have had a general law on young persons which drafts our public policies. Public policies for young people 2020 to 2024 was co-created with youth from the drafting phase through the methodological design and it included a participatory consultative process and final adoption in which youth from civil society were involved. This public policy is new and given its high participation of young people from throughout the country and from different groups, young people, young indigenous people, Afro-descendant people, migrants, refugees, those deprived of their freedoms, rural youth, those with disabilities and LGBTQ. Throughout the process, we have worked with a number of institutions and organizations, including the UN system agencies in Costa Rica. As a country with a considerable and recognized democratic tradition, we believe that crafting this broad, inclusive and participatory public policy for youth has meant that this policy should take account of their diversities, their distinctions based on age ranges and their, their specific approach to rural and urban ecosystems. We also have a gender-based approach as well as a territorial-based approach. We address social justice and sustainable development. The plan of action involves 54 institutions with more than 300 actions focusing on four key strategies. And currently we are developing an IT system to monitor and assess the public policy and its plan of action with direct participation of young people from civil society. I would like to extend an invitation to the Secretary General's envoy for youth in Costa Rica to participate in the National Council for Youth Forum. It's a high level forum which will be presided over by the President of the Republic and it would be an honor to have you with us as we commemorate the independence bicentenary of our Central American region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you for also your invitation and I look forward to working with you in the future and of course participating in the session of the of the Parliament uh, online or offline as, as COVID-19 situations permit. Now, let me give the floor to the Flemish Minister for Brussels Affairs, Youth and Media of Belgium, and the Youth Delegate of the French-speaking community of Belgium. Thank you very much, Ms. Chair, uh, dear colleagues, UN Youth Representatives, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first thank you uh, for organizing this interactive virtual roundtable on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of the ECOSOC Youth Forum. The three communities of Belgium have a long-standing tradition in youth participation and partnerships, which is reflected in SDG 17. The respective youth councils are established by ACT and CAN give advice on their own initiative on all topics that concern young people. Children and young people should not only be seen as the future, but first and foremost as a group that exists here and now, today. It is crucial to pay attention to the voice of children and young people and to act on it. A good example in this respect is the extensive preparation of the present four questions with all actors involved within the three communities of Belgium. 
Conversations with young people show that they are active and engaged and are agents of change. Through their engagement, young people contribute to the 2030 agenda and help keep certain topics on the agenda. By structurally anchoring youth participation in all policy areas, especially areas that concern them, young people are given the opportunity to have a greater and more direct impact on the implementation of the SDGs. To reach the goals set out by the 2030 agenda, all actors and relevant partners need to be on board. The National Commission for the Rights of the Child in Belgium is currently running a process for and together with children and young people to translate the concluding observations for Belgium in a way that is tailor-made for children and young people and establishes an explicit link with the SDGs in the final reflections. The SDGs are also present in the Flemish Youth and Children's Rights Policy Plan, which sets out five priorities with a direct link with the SDGs in each chapter. Recently, the French community also has engaged in five -year, a four-year EU program with the aim of providing opportunities for young people to engage towards the fulfillment of the SDGs at the local level, while connecting with their counterparts across different regions in Europe. Also, the German-speaking community has established, uh, established a youth strategic plan, which considers the SDGs was also drafted by a cross-sectoral working group gathering individual young people and representatives of the youth work sector, the government and the ministry. I, do, I would finally like to use the opportunity to thank the Belgi Belgian U UN youth delegates who are working actively on all these key topics. Ladies and gentlemen, it is sometimes said with nostalgia that this generation is a weak generation. I am convinced of the contrary. Also, during the COVID crisis, this young generation has demonstrated commitment, solidarity and resilience. And we should not only talk about young people, but we must especially talk with them. Young people should be able to actively participate in policy decisions, not only on a national level, but also within the UN bodies, including the ECOSOC High Level Political Forum. To underline the importance of youth participation, I would now like to give the floor to one of the UN youth delegates from the French community, Ms. Oriane Schmidt. Thank you very much. Dear Chair, Mrs. Tayat Mawikramanayak, dear Excellencies, dear fellow delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor today to take the floor together with the Minister Benjamin Dell to present the work of Belgian UN youth delegates in relation to the SDGs. As delegates representing the youth of our country, we are trying to put the SDGs in the picture as often as possible. On a local level, we try to bring these goals closer to the children and youth through education, through social media platforms, and by implementing concrete youth-led youth -led projects. To give just a few examples, we are working on gender equality, we are working on climate and sustainable food systems. At the federal level, we are in contact with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Permanent Mission, which allows us to bring the voice of young Belgian youth on the international scene and to take the floor at official events. We work also closely with other UN youth delegates from other countries. In 2020, the Decade of Action called for accelerating sustainable solutions to deliver the SDGs by 2030. The COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted every aspect of our lives and hidden vulnerable groups such as young people. This didn't affect young people's engagement. Young people are agents of change and they deserve a seat at the table. The, the Agenda 2030 needs to be implemented together with young people Thank you very much, Arane. I think we ran out of time, but we really appreciate your contributions. And we also look forward to putting your statement online in the Ecosoc Youth Forum website so others can see it. With that, I want to pass the floor to another important partner of ours, the Y20 Chair from 2020, Mr. Othman A. Alomamar. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, excellencies, distinguished ministers, participants and attendees, I wish you all a good morning, good evening or good afternoon wherever you are around the world. I'm both honored and excited to join you here in this forum's 10th anniversary. During 2020, I had the privilege and also the responsibility to be young people's voice to the G20. 
As chair of the Youth 20 Engagement Group during the COVID-19 pandemic, I experienced firsthand the effect of the pandemic on young people's representation, as well as the exponential need for young people's voice to be heard in decision-making tables. We all know that young people face challenges that are unprecedented in education, employment, mental health, and in many other topics. With COVID-19, these challenges have been exasperated even further. Uh, the pandemic has not only just pushed these challenges to further levels of, of need for youth, but also increased the level of ambiguity with which young people's future uh, are being prepared for. This is why in 2020, myself, along with 77 uh, delegates from 23 countries, as well as four international organizations, drafted the Youth Communique, a COVID-19 statement, and three white papers to really support young people's voice being heard at the G20 level. And these topics were related to SDGs, youth empowerment, inclusion, and the future of work. Whilst our advocacy to the G20 is successful, it is not enough. With 50% of the world's population being younger than 30, and the majority of which living in developing country, it is imperative that we support and partner with youth, especially during the pandemic, as they are amongst the most vulnerable groups. This support could take on many forms, such as increasing young people's roles in the SDGs achievement, the cascaded initiative at the community level, or through looking at policies from a youth lens or supporting an investment in pro-youth initiatives uh, that tackle important topics such as education and employment. While we all in this forum believe that young people are the future, the preparation, support, and partnership with young people has to be started today. And that's in order to empower them to achieve the SDGs as well as live in a prosperous future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Othman, for that very precise and focused statement on what exactly needs to be done uh, from the lessons learned from the Y20 experience last year. I would now like to give the floor to a joint intervention from the Mexican youth delegates together with the Director General of the Youth Institute of Mexico. Buenas tardes a todas y todos. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the government of Mexico, I greet all young people who have made this youth forum possible. And I also greet the Secretary General Youth Envoy, Jayathma Rikramanayake. My name is Andrea Ruiz de la Mora, and I'm 22 years old and a member of the Mexican delegation for this forum as a youth delegate. I am pleased to be at this forum 10 years after its inception. We welcome the holding of this meeting and we are pleased that over the years this has become a forum for cooperation, advocacy and participation of youth with, uh, as a global benchmark, bringing young people from all over the world together. We welcome it because in this context, more than ever, it's relevant to have youth participation in discussions and solutions. And we must continue to speak out in this forum to act and to have it act as a benchmark for discussion in order to improve the decision-making process. We are subjects of rights and key agents of change. And we must open spaces to express our concerns, our needs, and above all, our contributions must be borne in mind as a result of, as we tackle the fallout of the pandemic. Now I'd like to give the floor to the Director General of the Institute. Good afternoon. Thank you, Andrea, for being part of this delegation. It's an honor for me to be in this forum and to share with you what the government of Mexico is doing, particularly the Mexican Youth Institute. We are convinced that youth are the heart of change. Our government has invested the most in this sector of the population. We have youth programs, building the future, youth writing the future. We also have specific programs in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic as we seek to address the toll on our mental health and our economy. In our Mexican Youth Institute, we've promoted two initiatives. One, Youth Contact, developed together with the Secretariat of Health and UNICEF to contribute to improving mental health for teens and our youth through professional involvement and the involvement of other youth through WhatsApp, and also to address issues of stress, violence, to provide uh, sex education and um, advice with regard to substance abuse. We are also promoting 
economic support in other fora. We have an educational network for solidarity and uh, social economy. We are contributing to the economic well-being of our youth and giving them tools and skills for uh, to establish entrepreneurships. And we've also trained more than 3,000 young people and we are providing them with seed money for projects. These two programs have one thing in common, partnerships. It would not be possible without our interinstitutional uh, support. Today, we are convinced that the goals and the aspirations of Agenda 2030, the interpreter apologizes, the sound has been cut off. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we ran out of time. Thank you very much, Director General, for highlighting how partnerships have helped the Mexican Youth Institute to come up with exciting programs. Now, last but certainly not least, it's my pleasure to welcome the last speaker of the Ministerial Roundtable. I thank you so much for your patience throughout. Now I welcome the Executive Director of the National Institute of Youth of Argentina. Do we have Argentina online? Looks like we don't. I think we lost Argentina. So we do not have Argentina right now. But I also want to mention that the minister of the transitional government of Libya was also online and we lost him at some point. And then the government of Sierra Leone, the minister of youth and sport of Sierra Leone, also we lost yesterday and we couldn't uh, connect him. So the connectivity challenges are very real, not only for young people, but also for some of our government counterparts. Let's try one more time to connect Argentina. Unfortunately, I think it's not possible for us to connect at this time. Looks like the streaming is not working. So I will have to wrap it up. And I um, I recall again, Argentina, Libya, and Sierra Leone, who couldn't uh, join us for speaking, even though they were connected to the meeting due to technical issues and connectivity issues. And I thank all ministers, high level representatives, um, young people, partners, civil society organizations, academic institutions, everyone who were a part of this session. Um, and I am looking forward to a great discussion in the plenary. I would now like to introduce the moderator of our next session on leaving no youth behind. Please join me in welcoming Derek Leon, Washington, OHCHR's UN Human Rights Senior Regional Minority Fellow at the UN headquarters in New York City, a cultural anthropologist, curator and artist. Derek, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. The title of our plenary is Leaving No Youth Behind, Addressing the Long-Term Consequences of COVID-19 for Vulnerable Youth Groups. Now that's a long title, but today we have empathetic youth. Also, we have defiant youth representing themselves, their countries, and their communities. Before I go on further, I'd like to acknowledge that OHCHR New York, UN headquarters, and myself are located on Lenape ancestral homeland, what's now called New York City. We have one of the highest indigenous populations in the Americas, including youth. So I wanted to start off our plenary with naming these indigenous peoples and being grateful that we're on their land. It has been also said that the arc of the, the, arc of the moral universe is long. Some of our panelists today, they're bending that arc, they're pushing it, and they're being defiant in the process, fighting for climate justice, indigenous and minority justice, LGBTQI justice, and, and more. I'm just a little bit sad that we don't have all the panelists here in New York City, 
but I'm happy that we have such a diversity of voices from all over the world. Just a few of our objectives today is actionable steps forward, intersectional aspects, we're gonna talk about that even further, and inclusive conversational style. This is uh, here in New York City, it's later in the day, and for some of our panelists, it's late at night, so we're going to be more relaxed. But before I go further, I am happy to introduce Mr. Elliot Harris of Trinidad and Tobago, Assistant Secretary General for Economic Development and Chief Economist. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Derek. Dear friends, welcome to you all. I'm delighted to be here with you today to discuss a crucial element of our work with and for young people. The principle of leaving no one behind is the cornerstone of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It is also the commitment to eliminate the inequalities that prevent individuals from accessing resources and seizing opportunities to reach their full potential. This applies to one's own development, but also to one's agency to positively impact one's community, one's country. Clearly, the principle of leaving no one behind also applies to young people. When I think of transformative agency, I think of young people, but also of the many barriers they face in accessing services, resources, and opportunities. The United Nations family is painfully aware that a large proportion of today's youth experience multiple vulnerabilities, such as the combination of poverty, low levels of education, gender inequalities, and disabilities, and that this complex reality too often goes unseen, undocumented, and unaddressed. These vulnerabilities are being compounded now by the COVID-19 pandemic. Preliminary data show that the pandemic's social and economic effects have increased pre-existing inequalities, pushing vulnerable youth further away from opportunities and from a well-rounded development. We also understand that young people's experiences of the pandemic and of life in general are extremely diverse, given that youth is far from being a homogenous group. We need to do a better job of addressing not only the different vulnerabilities, but also how these vulnerabilities intersect with each other. For instance, low incomes, lower education levels, inadequate access to social services, and a lack of social protection have exacerbated the risks and consequences that young people face during and will face in the aftermath of the pandemic. Our policies and programs need to take into account young people's lived experiences and they need to address the root causes of these vulnerabilities and the challenges that they raise. Out of this pandemic, we want to, we need to build back better. The inclusion of a diverse array of young people is a cornerstone of these efforts to achieve a truly inclusive recovery. We're here today to listen to and learn from an outstanding group of young persons living with multiple vulnerabilities and yet actively and passionately engaged in supporting their communities and advocating for them. These young speakers embody dedication to the principle of inclusion and show all of those working on the 2030 agenda how to make the leaving no one behind principle a reality. Although these stories shared today and through these stories shared today, we want to foster an intergenerational dialogue with UN practitioners and identify concrete commitments for now and for the near future to help ensure that no youth is left behind in the global efforts to rebuild after the pandemic and to strengthen our shared resilience. To start this dialogue, we're joined by two UN colleagues working on the ground with young people. They will share concrete examples of how working with and for vulnerable youth can make a world of difference, both for individual youth and for their communities. I will stop here so that we can start listening to these amazing young speakers. I'll come back to you at the end to share a few quick thoughts. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, ASG Harris. And I love how you said we build back together we build back better, and I think we'll be able to do that. And thank you for being present during this whole session. For the run-up show, I'll explain, we have five amazing young persons, including two UN representatives. We'll first start with three of those youth speakers. We'll ask them questions, we'll ask three of those questions. Then we'll go to our final two youth, and they'll give testimonials, and then also we will ask them questions as well. During that time in the chat, we want this to be as interactive as possible. Please send your questions or comments. For our two UN representatives, we have the UN Resident Coordinator in Albania and also the Special Rapporteur 
on rights to freedom of peaceful assembly and of association. Further housekeeping, this session is available in all six UN languages. We offer sign language and closed caption for interpretation. See the language button on the UN Web TV page in the bottom right corner of the main screen. Also, as has been said through these past two days, is we have representation from all over the world. So there might be crying babies, there might be sirens, people might drop off, but we're going to be patient. For myself, I have three screens and also I have my cell phone as I receive notes. So as a dancer, I might be moving my head, but we're going to be patient. And again, we're so happy that we have so much representation. For our first youth speaker, Angelica Ojinaka, and she's interested and she has a passion for youth and for mental health. She's been worked on a grassroots level, mobilizing and building multilateral conversations that's inclusive. One of the many things that she has done is she's co-authored an international report on the experiences of girls and young women that has representation from 99 countries. So calling Angelica on the floor, the question that I ask that I pose is, what brought you to dedicate yourself, your life, and your passions to vulnerable youth? Angelica. Thank you so much, Derek, for your question. And hello to all who are attending this historic global session. Just to introduce myself further, my name is Angelica Janaka, and I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians, the indigenous people of the land from which I'm speaking from in Sydney, Australia, the Watamadigal people of the Darug Nation. I'm a 23 year old Nigerian Australian youth advocate and the founding member of the African Australian Youth Suicide Prevention Committee. I'm also a youth advocate member of the UN Major Group for Children and Youth and a former youth activist for Plan International Australia. My dedication to youth experiencing vulnerabilities comes from my realities in my own living experience. So from the age of three to 20, I witnessed and experienced different forms of gender-based violence. I became a young carer of a sibling with a um, disability as well, and have supported a single parent household and endured various mental health challenges and different forms of discrimination and exclusion along the way. But throughout my life, I've realized that the environments around me weren't created with my identity in mind and my community in mind. Instead, we're being considered an afterthought that doesn't fit into the status quo. And unfortunately, we've seen that the pre-COVID-19 world has undeniably failed girls and young women like me with, um, and many other youth with intersecting identities. It's failed to protect us, it's failed to listen to us, and it's failed to empower us. Within my own context and community, the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in severe economic and social disruptions and increased anxiety and loneliness. And I like to use this um, description of feeling trapped um, and stuck in a maze of increasing worries and evaporating hopes about my future, our futures, um, and the way out. But what is hope Hopeful though is to see the continued grassroots mobilization um, of youth for transformational change. This is truly what keeps me dedicated to ensure children and young people of intersecting identities are valued and engaged in non-tokenistic ways. In my own work with fellow migrant youth of ethnic backgrounds that are similar and different to my own, we engage in local initiatives and devise supportive cultural culturally safe ideas that impact our social and economic well-being. And myself, like many other youth, we view ourselves as reachable, not hard to reach, but the strategies that are used to engage us lack extensive continuous commitment. These strategies don't lean into enough into our individual and community resilience. And many young people feel like we're framed as just becoming adults rather than individuals, um, uh, equal individuals, regardless of our age especially for those who do experience gender-based violence, trauma, and mental health challenges. So my lived experience continues to drive me forward and my community uses the power of experiences to mobilize action for changes to gender um, inequality, disproportionate mental health impacts as well. And with this being the historic 10th anniversary of the ECOSOC Youth Forum, I can attest to what I have seen and heard from communities this, thus far, that youth, have already created the tables ourselves. Tables where many intersectional identities are represented and heard. We are beyond now having a seat at the table 
in my opinion. We're not here to be commodified or be a tick box. It's time for governments and stakeholders and decision makers to provide a space for our own tables that, we, that already exist, that we have co-created and designed. And join us on these tables that we've designed to foster further intergenerational dialogues, center marginalized voices, and reimagine programs and initiatives for economic and social recovery and build accountability mechanisms. This all together that will co-create and action our recommendations for a just and sustainable future for all youth. Thank you. Thank you, Angelica. As I was writing down notes, I'm thinking that should be a song of a title, Not Hard to Reach. And <laughs> it's also amazing as beyond a seat at the, the table, there's so much rich things that you, you said and you were not calling people out and governments out, but you were calling them in. And exactly. I think that's what we're trying to definitely to today. So we will return to you. I, I have some more questions. I'm sure the audience does as, as well. Again, thank you for your, your words and just um, how they resonate with us. Our next youth speaker is Nujin Mustafa. And for the short period of time that I've known her virtually um, since we've talked through our meetings, 8 a.m. meetings in New York City, and also, as I, I did some research just on her story um, in Syria and then migrating to, to Europe and just the intersecting obstacles that she's had, but also how not focusing just on those obstacles, but telling her story and showing how she and her communities rose to the challenge. So for Eugene, I have a, a question, a, a broad question is, would you be able to share just a few highlights of your journey and tell us about your, your current work, Eugene. So, um, thank you, Derek. So, I, I'm going to start with a bit of a formal introduction. My name is Nujim Mustafa, and I'm from Kobani, Syria. Years ago, I fled the war in my home country and made it to the, my destination in Germany after crossing eight countries. The themes of intersectionality and inclusive participation, or lack thereof, have been a part of my life since I was born. And my experience as a person with a disability could be summarized with one sentence. I was not important enough. As a child, I was not important enough for schools to be made accessible to me. I was not important enough <clears throat> to be provided with any means or opportunities to grow or dream or build and achieve my goals. And as a young woman, civil war raged, raged in my country. So I was once again stripped of, uh, of the right to a safe and peaceful life. When I fled, even the management of the refugee camp didn't think that refugees with disabilities were important enough for something as essential as the restroom to be accessible. Young people with, with disabilities are interested in, in a wide range of topics and issues relevant to today's world, such as mental health, they have so much to offer. And every country, government, and organization would benefit from, from, their, uh, from their experiences, ideas, and proposals. Yet, their potential remains unfulfilled because young people with disabilities are still fighting for, uh, for rights that other people take for granted, such as the right to inclusive education, access to assistive devices, and involvement in the policy and decision-making processes. Um, youth with disability is still considered not important enough to be a part, to be a, uh, to be a, a key role, a role player in, on, the, in, uh, on the international community stage. So it's um, in the ten years since the uh, since in, uh, its inception, 
This is the first time that this forum has attempted to listen to the, to the voice of a young person with a, with a disability. And yet it, it, it is still far from being accessible to everyone. And this is unacceptable. So I hope that this session will insp inspire all of us to take action and be a part of the much needed change. Because young people with disabilities and their colorful identities are not a liability, but an asset in the collective effort to make the world a better place. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nujin. And I was taking notes and I was trying to look at the dots and make a eye contact as well. And I love how you use first person language, as you said, persons with disabilities. And I want to highlight that in, in, our, in our, our talk as well. I do want to say that you are very important enough. And, I, and again, I'm going to go back and circle through some of the great ideas that you uh, said. For our next youth speaker, this would be Tushar Badia. And Tushar, um, again, I did some research on you and just so many things that you've done as an educator, as a human rights defender in Bangladesh, but also what I found amazing is a, a peacemaker and again, building bridges as well. And it's amazing that you're our third speaker because what you say builds bridges and shows the intersectional um, experiences of young people all around the world. And what comes to mind is that the personal is political. And through your, your work with LGBTQI um, persons, um, that speaks to that. So without um, explaining more, would you be able to take us back to the early stages of the pandemic and describe the situation of your communities? Of communities? Thank you, Derek. Uh, when, you, when you say that I am an educator, peacemaker, and human rights activist, it's actually combined everything when you talk about LGBTIQ community. Because uh, if you ask me why I play these multiple roles, I want to go back to Nuzin's sentences that she quote that I was not important enough. So when you talk about LGBTI com community, it's a big community around the world, but still we are not important enough. So I think the COVID-19 situation hit everybody and it hit the societal norms and our belief and, uh, in, and shifted our culture in a different way. But how the COVID-19 hit the LGBTIQ community that I will present on behalf of the entire LGBTIQ community. I might not be able to approach each of the part of the community, but I will tell you in such a way that you can have an overview what we went through and still we're, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're uh, very much furious to see um, from this pandemic. So in Bangladesh, COVID-19, um, uh, I mean, uh, people started to realize COVID-19 and its impact on first uh, week of March and the government uh, in, uh, gave the lockdown on 23rd. From 23rd March, it took 14 days for the government to start distributing the relief package to a different vulnerable community and also for the mass community. But the day we started seeing that the lockdown is imposed, we started taking initiatives and it took us only one day to start giving support to marginalized community, vulnerable community. Now, when, when we see that the government took 14 days to react or to uh, help the vulnerable groups, we were thinking whether uh, who should be in the position of power and courage and preparedness. So I think youths were there and the people who worked for the community, the youth, youth people, they were there and they were prepared more than the government for this pandemic. Now, when, when, we, when we started distributing a uh, uh, food package and started uh, going to seek uh, who is actually there uh, who need uh, support. It was very interesting and it was very frustrating that no, not a single contact, direct contact was there 
in the store. It, it is not with the civil society. It was not with us. It was not with any government officials or government office who support the marginalized community. For instance, when we started uh, uh, collecting money from different uh, crowdsourcing platform and we were ready to support the local LGBTIQ community, we found that there was no contact of the transgender community in different social welfare agencies or different uh, you know, uh, act, uh, NGOs who work with uh, transgender community. One reason is that many of us are actually scared of breaching of data privacy. Uh, uh, you might be aware that Facebook's data uh, has been leaked and maybe millions of users' data is now on public record. So maybe because of that, many people think that this LGBTIQ community is much vulnerable and if we collect and store data, they might be more vulnerable and they are not ready to safeguard that data and take the responsibility. So I think from that, there was no data and we had to run here and there and work overnight to check uh, who is the potential beneficiary and who is suffering. Uh, now, we had a benefit because Bangladesh has the largest uh, mobile financial services in the whole world. And during the lockdown, where there was no scope for us to go and support in person. So this mobile financial service helped us. And through that, we started collecting different mobile phone numbers. Now, there is another story, not all of them have a mobile phone. We know that SGD, um, uh, SDG 5 um, and um, uh, gender equality also have one uh, sub goal that empowering women to digital device, maybe a mobile phone. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that everybody is know how much important it is um, to have a mobile phone nowadays. So I was, it was very frustrating to know that even a, a majority number of the transgender committee members in Bangladesh was not having a mobile phone. So we had to contact with them via their brother, sister, cousin, or maybe a store that uh, that is situated near to them. So it was very much new to us, but I think that if the government's database, if it was there, that could be a help for us. Now, the same situation happened in Indonesia as well. There were more than 600 transgender community members who were struck in, uh, in Jakarta last year, and they were not given uh, any food relief packages because they they were not having an ID card because of their gender identity. They were transgender and they were not given any identity card. So data privacy and, uh, you know, um, acknowledging the identity of LGBTI community is much more important, not for the future, but also to tackle this sort of pandemic in future. So, you know, if you don't have any large uh, if you have a large community without any identity, without any identity card, without any data, how for the policymakers of the states to help them. Now, a part of the data privacy and the legal recognition of LGBTIQ community, I, I want to highlight some of the acts, the government initiatives and, um, uh, and the militaristic, militaristic approach that various government took. For instance, in Philippines, uh, people of LGBTI community were harassed. They were forced to live and uh, uh, act in degradative manner uh, just because they were LGBTIQ community and people were furious. And especially they were blaming LGBTI community for spreading COVID-19. Not only in Philippines, it happened in Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, and all over the world. In Korea, uh, for instance, uh, one LGBTI person was was uh, in 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 viral mode in uh, various platforms because uh, he was being exposed to public as a COVID-19 positive and a gay a gay man and people were uh, uh, exposing him saying that he went to the gay club and spread the COVID-19 virus everywhere. Now the government, many of the government, uh, disclosed the COVID-19 patients' demographic information which was a breach of privacy. And also it is very much important for LGBTIQ community. So when they were disclosing the particular information of COVID-19 patients, they, they were supposed to be very much sensitive regarding what particular person's in information they are sharing with public or not. Um, so, Tushar? Yes. So uh, definitely, so we have to get to the, the next person. 
but yeah, uh, sure. we're gonna we're gonna return to you but i understand the importance of you have so much to say is because we need more representation on gender expressions lbgqi and it's it's a shame that you have to speak for so many people because that representation isn't spoken enough at the intergovernmental level so it's i'm hard to, to cut you off but i know the importance of your work of how you talked about data and if the data wasn't there and the technology wasn't there you use word of mouth and that's super powerful but you putting and we say in english dropping the gauntlet we're going to have more discussions and more representations because it's sorely uh, sorely needed but we're going to continue i have some more questions for you now going back sure. to angelica i for this portion we're going to ask questions to our the three youth speakers that have already spoken and angelica we're still in a pandemic and one in five adolescents worldwide are living with mental health conditions exasperated by the COVID-19 pandemic and the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. There's so many different things happening and it's amazing that you're able to, you have this privilege to speak for people that may not have this opportunity. Do you have any recommendations to amplify and also importantly empower these young persons? Yes, so thank you, Derek. I think that's such an um, important question to ask. And I know that currently at this stage, there's been a lot of, like I mentioned earlier, uh, marginalization and re traumatization that is um, occurring amongst all youth from differing um, experiences. And I guess to overcome this, we really need to prioritize attainable, flexible, and timely support that covers all social and economic rights of these youth, not only looking at mental health at a diagnosis level or not only looking at online safety, physical safety um, and being away from harm at a surface level, but examining the methods to address social determinants of health and social issues leading to these ongoing challenges. And additionally to that, we must urgently actually invest in strengthening collaborative, tangible, non-tokenistic feedback mechanisms that allow us to access assess the extent of marginalization in these communities, but also the youth need to be able to scrutinize the efforts that are being made on all levels regarding these challenges. And we need to use the existing community groups that are already providing the psychosocial, psychosocial support and advocacy at a grassroots level, because that's powerful too. And I know that we've um, moved into this shift of using digital technologies to engage youth, um, most isolated by violence, um, most isolated um, because of climate and other mental health and me mental health challenges. However, we also need to acknowledge that um, we have a lack of, some youth have lack of digital connectivity um, whilst being in unsupportive and unsafe environments. And also online strategies may not be effective all the time because there is an increased vulnerability that youth have to online harassment and abuse. And we've seen that over this pandemic. So I guess governments and other power holders need to shift towards an intersectional approach that's, that captures this difference, as well as capturing desegregated data about these experiences on young people in all environments. Thank you. And, and that's uh, amazing relating to what Tushar was saying with social media and the, the importance of, of data. And I think with uh, young persons understanding technology technology and using technology. I would like to call Eugene and building on what Angelica said, um, the question I have is, what are your comments or do you have anything to add about collecting that in a matter that accurately captures the intersectionality of, of vulnerabilities that you spoke of previously? Eugene. No, um, I, I would like to stress once, um, to once more stress the importance of the, you know, uh, and the prevalence of intersectionality within the youth community. Um, a large number of them belong to more than one group, um, um, and each has its different needs and different issues that need needs, need addressing. So um, I think that, you know, um, having having segregated da data and. and just ha um, having kind of that kind of, you know, that kind of overview of um, of with uh, the youth community and how you know 
it's just it's just the we need to we need to recognize how important that that is and how how much it makes everyone's job easier to to kind of have this um to have this to have this overview of um of the youth community and to uh, to, uh, to to make sure that um the data collection process um, is a, is a, is a, is inclusive is inclusive of everyone so that we we all might help everyone better because you know data uh, i um i cannot i cannot like emphasize that enough data collection helps visibility when, when you are when you are doing research you are seeing that person you are talking to them you are interacting and that that helps i mean um to have to have the to have these to have these points addressed and spoken about and you know written written in paper and in reports um and th that's you know and that's that's another that's another aspect where kind of the the the, inclu the, inclu the inclusive and comprehensive process of data collection where um marginalized groups are included such such as you know um um Persons with disabilities or um, refugees with disabilities. So um, um, really, it's it's just, it's just a matter of um, of uh, increasing and standard standardizing the process of uh, in, um, incl inclusive uh, inclusive the, uh, inclusive and more uh, more pervasive de data collection so that it you know so that everyone and every person might be visible to uh, people that you know might make a difference in their lives thank you thank you eugene and uh, again i was i was looking at the dot to to see you but then also i, I see on my phone that there's comments that that uh, people facing disabilities shouldn't be silenced but they should be embraced also how you brought in the voice of minorities as as well so i want to thank our our audiences for for that again thank you for your words Tushar, we meet again and you you've already uh, uh, beaten to the punch about my next question is could you provide concrete examples of how your guidance would reach support marginalized communities which you are already doing but do you have any other examples that you could share with us Yes, thank you, Derek. I think Nuzin pointed out one of the recommendations that I had in my mind, but a part of that, I think the government should be active in tackling stigma that harms LGBTIQ community uh, in the pandemic. I'll also recommend for the government to legally recognize the identity of LGBTIQ community across the world. And even if there is no recognition is possible because of the contextual or cultural barrier, they could at least give them an, an ID card so that they can get help when they need it. Um, also, I will urge the government to classify uh, community-led organizations' uh, effort as an essential service during this sort of pandemic so that they can uh, provide the services to everyone uh, and within a short time. And also, they can move without any restriction during the pandemic. And also, I will urge the donors and supporters to uh, provide flexible funding for small-scale organizations to who works at, at the very grassroots level, they, they should omit the uh, requirement of registration or other things so that they can uh, they can make the best possible effort during this pandemic and help the marginalized community. I think that's all uh, I had in my mind for the recommendation part. Thank you, Derek. Well, thank you. And you said that's all that you had. That was uh, a lot. And I would like to thank you and just all the other youth panelists again in our meetings that this is really youth led and how all of you really came to to work and to show up and to show for your communities and to show the world so i'm receiving a lot of comments that they're inspired by your words and the other panelists words. so that's amazing thank you again to shop so we're going to have almost a mental break we have three amazing speakers we have two more speakers and then i'm going to ask them questions after and then we'll talk with our our un representatives our first or our next youth speaker is Alba Muranaka Yakabalekesh. She's a young indigenous Mayakiche woman from Guatemala. She's particularly concerned with the accelerated effect of climate change 
on indigenous communities and also how that affects poverty and other issues. She's interested in the role of ancestral indigenous knowledge. Again, I'll repeat that. She's interested in the role of ancestral indigenous knowledge and practices as a key path to overcome poverty. A question I have for you, Anba Veronica, is could you please share or just give us a glimpse of your journey from advocacy to community work, as well as how you became a human rights defender? Albert. Many thanks indeed, Derek. It is a pleasure to be on this panel here as a representative of Indigenous Peoples in Guatemala. My name is Alba Veronica Yabalcoige. I represent the network of young human rights defenders of the Office of the High Commissioner in the United Nations in Guatemala. I'm also representing the Association ID EI that also works with indigenous peoples and we have worked extensively over more than 25 years with indigenous peoples. I focus primarily on the challenges that indigenous people face. Historically, in historic, historically we've been victims of discrimination and racist acts in our countries waged by the state sometimes. We haven't even been recognized within our law laws or within decision making fora, the COVID-19 pandemic has laid bare these problems that we as Indigenous peoples face. It has made all the more acute and visible problems of poverty, inequality and crises in the healthcare systems and education systems. Where education is concerned, young people have been those most gravely affected by the loss of access to education. At the beginning of the pandemic, classes were suspended in Guatemala. This prompted major problems for indigenous young people in terms of continuing their education. After some time, classes went online and they, uh, as young people, weren't able to navigate on digital platforms. They didn't have that knowledge or that those skills to access those training. Guatemala has many communities that don't have electricity or internet connections, such as to be able to access virtual learning. And that reflects the inequalities that we as indigenous people suffer. In the face of this situation, num a number of young people took the decision to migrate to the United States to ultimately ease the crisis and ease its effects on them. Many families didn't even have any food left in the face of the pandemic. And consequently, many young people made the choice to travel to the United States to ultimately be able to support their families. Many didn't manage to cross the border. They w were left in Mexico and then returned to Guatemala. When they returned to Guatemala, they were victims of social stigma and discrimination because they were considered to be carriers of COVID-19. However, in our country, indigenous people made a worked extensively and made significant contributions to mitigating this COVID crisis, this education crisis, the poverty crisis, but particularly the education crisis. Many young people working in education developed their own means and used their own resources to ensure that young people could continue to access education and would not be left behind. In our view, education is crucial to achieve the sustainable development goals. Moreover, Many young people showed an interest in restoring the ancestral practices of their community, is returning to their in, uh, in identi identity as young indigenous people. They were interested in using their indigenous mother tongues. And it's important for us as indigenous people uh, to do that as part of this fight against a system that has exercised discrimination against us for many, many years. We also saw the use, the increased use of ancestral plants and crops during COVID-19. That's vital because in indigenous communities, healthcare is not accessible for all. There are not many clinics and far fewer hospitals. Consequently, ancestral medicinal knowledge was crucial in reaching indigenous communities, young people, and stemming the COVID-19 pandemic, which dealt them a heavy blow. Young people also worked extensively to recover the use of matern mother tongues and also in using mother tongues to convey public health messages 
to Indigenous peoples. And this was important because the Minister of Health didn't issue uh, material in languages understandable to Indigenous people regarding uh, curbing the spread of COVID-19. So this work in mother tongues was vital. And what we also saw was connecting with the, the connection with the um, Office for the Commissioner of Human Rights in Guatemala, working with them was vital to disseminating uh, uh, health information and to recording all the acts of violence and discrimination waged against indigenous people against the backdrop of the pandemic. We had a forum working with the High Commissioner to express our ideas, our thoughts, and to ultimately raise awareness about the sustainable development goals that the United Nations has established and we were also able to work with the office to co make our contributions to achieving the SDGs. Forests such as these are vital for us uh, as Indigenous peoples because we're able to make our voice heard and that's particularly important because often our voice is not heard so this was an important step forward for us Indigenous peoples and the fact that I'm here today talking about my ideas the, the way I think the way I live and all of the experiences that I've had as an Indigenous woman in a, at a community level is also vital and is part of my commitment to raising awareness about the many challenges that we as Indigenous peoples face I know we're facing many challenges I'm listening to my colleagues and their experience didn't differ a lot uh, to a large extent to my own they s suffered similar challenges to those I suffered as an indigenous person in Guatemala we're seeing human rights violations for example and these are common across many communities as we heard from my colleagues we as indigenous peoples contributed also to the mitigation of climate change through the use of ancestral knowledge that's been a key contribution I was talking about the increased use of medicinal plants these aren't recognized by the Guatemalan health system however they can make a vital contribution to healthcare. a number of young people that aren't indigenous are currently studying biochemistry in Guatemalan universities and they themselves are interested in knowing about the medicinal properties of, art, um, of indigenous crops and ancestral crops and that for us is very important as part of knowledge dissemination and is something that can be rolled out elsewhere. Now I should also point to the fact that we have a number of struggles underway when it comes to defending indigenous land. We're deeply concerned at climate change as a, as a threat to that land. We are though as primarily affected by climate change because we make we earn our crust through agriculture it's the main source of livelihood that we have and we're witnessing uh, climate change and consequently food security is under threat we're on the front lines and so as indigenous people we've developed ways of communicating with indigenous communities in order to preserve ancestral knowledges, knowledge and also to protect our land from the hands of multinationals who wish to grab our lands and seize our natural resources. Faced with these challenges in addition to these challenges we've also seen indigenous people, indigenous leaders, human rights defenders being persecuted, uh, intimidated, harassed by those wishing to claim land. They've been the victims of many a threat and so I wish to re report on these complaints uh, and these instances of abuse against Indigenous people so that our rights can be protected so that we're not persecuted as young people and as Indigenous people. We know that our contributions are valuable, be those to COVID-19 or elsewhere, and can enrich all the work that's underway for environmental protection. But I did want to make the abuse of Indigenous peoples known. Thank you. Thank you, Alba, Veronica, and just with your, your words, you're not making my job as a moderator easy because I'm getting so many messages of how you're speaking about the personal, your indigenous community, but also indigenous peoples, and really some indigenous peoples around the world, but also the intersectional aspects, so that's really an important. Um, moving along, I would like to get the floor to Linda Lukame, and who's been, she's 25 years old, and also is a researcher in criminal law. And the question I ask you is, can you share with us a little bit about your, your life path and what led to your, your career in women's um, rights, gender rights, and sexual rights? Linda. Thank you for the question, Derek. So uh, this is Linda from Dan. I, I am 25 years 
all the young Tunisian activists who activates, uh, who advocates for gender equality. I am the representative of the international she decides movement in Tunisia. As a researcher in criminal law and sciences, I focused my legal research on sexual rights in relation to physical integrity. As a lawyer, I actually helping pre uh, prepare the Universal Periodic Review of Tunisia Human Rights Record in 2022. In doing so, I will work on the recommendation related to gender and sexual rights in Tunisia law. It does for a while that I became interested in the feminist cause and I was looking for how to serve this cause. I started, it started at the beginning with the legal clinic in which we were taught listening techniques and the notion of victims. The global approach of legal clinic, which took all vulnerabilities into consideration, allowed us to understand, understand what patriarchy is. And there I started realizing how the patriarchy affected my life, my vision for my body and even my sexuality. Then I started step by step destroying this patriarchal culture, cultural heritage within me on, my, on one side and within my relatives on the other side. By my, involvement, by, by my involvement in feminist associations that work on sexuality and, and women rights, I discovered how much these communities suffer from politically, socially and economically discrimina discriminations. Following that, it is no longer enough for me to change and help myself and my loved ones, but rather to make a change in my, in my society. So I started by becoming a peer educator on sexual rights and reproductive health to educate young people on the question. And in every session, I get a personal satisfaction in destroying the stigmatization on women's body and sexuality invented by the society. Now I can say that I believe in the rights that I defend. My, my university career and training, my research subject and my job are always related to human rights. I don't see myself in anything else. Thank you, thank you so much for your attention and for having me here. Thank you. Well, thank you again, Linda. I don't think it's hard for people to, to keep their attention with your words and powerful and just that testimony as, as well. Thank you again. Going back to Alba Veronica, um, a question. So I have a question for, for Alba Veronica and Linda. In a succinct way, because we're a little bit um, behind time, can you share anything else that you or your communities have done as a reaction to the COVID-19 pandemic? Or, or just in general, you've already talked a little bit about that before, but something that you haven't shared. Muchas gracias, Derek. Hey, thanks indeed, Derek. Of course, we as an association and as, as the IDE Association, we've worked on climate change alongside young indigenous people. We've installed more than 100 allotments agroecological allotments and we've trained young indigenous people in agroecology and permaculture. We think that young people are once again interested in agriculture but also and more particularly in environmentally friendly agriculture. We know that the use of insecticides and pesticides is to be avoided and young people are interested in that. They're also interested in the use of renewable energy through bio, uh, my, uh, bio uh, and the use of bio waste treaters so that we can treat organic waste and so that we can ultimately stop the use of uh, kindling because we know that the use of kindling is high in Guatemala and that causes deforestation and consequently leads to climate change. We're also making use of new technologies and ensuring that our communities can access energy in a sustainable way when it comes to both agriculture and the use of 
energy in the home. We're looking at the sustainable use of gas, for example. And we're working alongside young people to implement all of these initiatives. If we work with young people, our work has a greater impact. And we know that these small actions on our part are leading to major change for young people and creating major fora in which they can discuss their ideas. And we think that our, these small experiments that we're undertaking can be rolled out elsewhere. It would be useful if we had more help from more other organisations so we can reach other young people elsewhere in the country that are suffering economic problems but are, that are also interested in getting involved in agriculture. Uh, particularly agriculture, which makes use of environmentally friendly practices. We want to continue training young people. We want to reach more communities. For the moment, we're working with three departments in Guatemala out of the 22 in the country. So we wish to see these experiments that are currently underway rolled out elsewhere, uh, ultimately nationally, so that their scope and impact can be increased and so that we can see our practices used elsewhere and we hope that we'll receive institutional support at a government level that we want the government support because we know that the work we're doing is important and we know it's something that should be acknowledged as must everything that young indigenous communities do within agriculture thank you thank you uh, again Uncle Veronica and I would like to say I got a text Zachary from Canada says that no SDGs can be achieved without intersectional inclusion and we see that with all of the speakers today, not just from uh, different countries, but just how they see um, just these issues in intersectional ways. That leads us back to Linda. And can you share how your work um, generally addresses different types of marginalization of women in Tunisia? Yeah, thank you. So when we talk, uh, I will talk about the, uh, the Tunisian women's situation. When we talk about Tunisian women's situation, it's important to bring up the gender economic inequality and that especially the rural women suffer about. They are victims of very difficult working conditions where the government didn't take any action to ensure human working conditions for them, despite the several accidents where many women workers ha had died because of this catastrophic situation. Also, they suffer from inequality where men get double pay for the same work. Moreover, the lockdown has aggravated, aggravated phenomena such as violence, which represent in the, a significant increase in domestic violence against women. And despite the existence of Tunisian law to protect women victims of violence, the state has not created a safe space where these ones can take refuge, refuge there. So many women and queer people find themselves blocked with their executioner, executioners and have no other alternatives. The pandemic has heightened also government ignorance of reproductive health, such as a total, a total lack of contraceptive means and the refusal of the most of reproductive services during the first period of, of COVID-19. Finally, I can say that despite our efforts as Tunisian feminist movement and civil society, women still suffer until today from the patriarchy system, we should do better and we should do more and we will stay fighting until we have our security and our fights and our rights and until we create a new world where she decides about her body, her life and her future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Linda. And I like how you, you talked about institutions, you talked about patriarchy as as well, and this leads us to our next two speakers. If we're talking about institutions and institutional change and how that can affect the lives of our communities and our countries, the two UN representatives. I'll first start with Miss Fiona McClooney, who is a UN resident coordinator in Albania. Just quickly, her bio is is long and deep, but she's an urban designer by education and practice. Her work in the UK and Canada her deep interest in poverty and equity, 
I, I give the floor. And just a general question is, just general points on, on inclusion of youth in Albania, and if you could relate that to some of the speakers today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Derek. Um, I really want to congratulate the youth speakers that have come before me and comment on the richness of the topics that they've covered. In Albania, we've attempted to incorporate the views and voice of youth in the work that we've done here. Um, and I want to give a couple of examples. First of all, we set up a youth advisory group, which includes men and women, um, girls and boys, um, people from uh, more disadvantaged Roma Egyptian communities, from the LGBTI community. And these 14 members have helped us and represented, given their inputs into our, our UN planning process, the preparation of our cooperation framework. We've also been working on a joint program with many of the UN agencies here, which has been working with 15 municipalities and has set up youth advisory groups at a municipal level. And those youth advisory groups have been um, helping municipalities on youth budgeting, including youth activism and being involved in youth policy work at municipal level. There's also a youth peer education forum, which deals with more sensitive issues to do with sexual and reproductive rights, to do with gender um, uh, identity, and is an informal network of 700 youth that um, have an opportunity to speak and talk to and support one another and have representation through some of the UN agencies into policy forum. There's some work being done with government on a youth law and some work being done on the bylaws and also a national action plan that also follows that. But it's all part of um, the framework of increasing the voice and opportunities for youth and young people from lots of different um, multi-sectional groups within the country and seeing that their voice is heard in the way in which the country further develops. Again, thank you for those words and being present and even being present during the meetings and giving guidance as well as, as how to interact with human mechanisms and also from your own experiences. It's been amazing and very helpful to the youth as, as well. For our next speaker, we have Clement Boulet, a special, he is the Special Rapporteur on the Rights to Freedom, a Peaceful Assembly and the Association uh, since April 2018. Again, he has a long and deep bio. He's done work as a human rights defender in his native Togo, but also across the world and especially across the continent of Africa. And just a, a general question I have for him is, have you been working or how have you been working towards leaving no youth behind? Clement, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, th thank you very much, uh, Derek. And uh, let me also thank the forum for inviting me to be part of this uh, important session. Uh, it is a privilege uh, to connect with remarkable youth leaders from around the world and share my experience as a UN independent expert with the ECOSOC uh, uh, Youth Forum. And as you say, I'm the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Association Peaceful Assembly. And let me say that young people are the most crucial and important component of a vibrant civil society. They are the drivers of protest movements with incredible capacity to mobilize society using digital and non-digital tools. They are the force behind the climate justice movement, as you can see uh, uh, from uh, uh, today, and advancing also women's rights, advocating for racial justice, uh, you can see from Black Lives Matter, uh, defending democracy, and you can just also witness this from uh, the ongoing uh, democratic movement and protests around the world. And one of the examples today is Myanmar, uh, but also in Algeria. And, and we can also highlight many of them. You can see that the collective force of the young, uh, young people is important, is important in order to, make, to, to, to lead to the change. And they are also the, the driving innovation for uh, social justice and taking advantage of technology to contribute to achieve the SDGs. And I have strongly, uh, since I took the mandate in 2018, as, as you mentioned, and continuously advocate for the promotion and the respect of the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and of association for children and youth, especially marginalized youth uh, group. This includes, for example, as you asked me to say that, uh, speaking out when the rights 
to peaceful assembly and association have been violated. When their rights have been violated, I was already outspoken. And we can, I can give you many examples from Nigeria, the protest, and from Yama, and from Belarus. And I'm, I'm, I was so very uh, uh, present in advocating for mentoring of youth leaders and their inclusion in the implementation of Agenda 2013, because I believe that uh, if we left uh, youth behind, so the agenda will not be accomplished because youth are the future of, of this world. And I'm also really, uh, 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 really uh, strongly urging government to ensure that the youth demands and voices are included in the building back after COVID-19. And as, a, as part of the 10 key principles that I drafted, and, and share in, two, in July 2020 with government to ensure that those 10 principles, when they are followed by the government, uh, they, can, they can help to keep civic space while the government is trying to address the, the, the COVID-19 issue or, or the, the, the health issue that we face. But I think that keeping this space for young people is important, ensuring that young people, even with, during this health crisis time, they are able to to be able to express their view, they are able to, to contribute, they are consulted on measure that is put in place is also important. But also, just also to end, giving you another example, my mandate also is quite heavily when I do the country visit as part of my mandate, I consulted with young people. I ensure that the report that I would drafted to suggest to the human to, to present to the Human Rights Council or General Assembly, I also contain also issue around young people, their demand, and how they see the future, in particular, in their country. So I will just give this few examples and, and hope that uh, we, we can continue uh, uh, to clarify certain issues uh, in the debate. Thank you very much, Derek. Let me stop there. Uh, thank you. Within your three minutes, you gave so much information and made so much, uh, so many connections. Uh, both of you, uh, as you and representatives, as this isn't just a conversation, between youth discussants, but thank you for, for giving your time today. For our this next session, we'll have a group discussion. This will be like a lightning round for our different discussants and youth participants, just quick answers. And I'll just give them simple questions. And really this is about recommendations, as in many of our discussants are not hard to reach. So I have Angelica again, and we've talked about data and a little bit about uh, desegregated data. And how about a question I have is related to gender and sex. So the question I have for you is, could you please share recommendations you have on this critical tool of desegregated data? Yeah, so I believe that we need to move to creating a clear global framework and initiative on how we obtain um, sex and gender specific data, but it needs to be framed with intersectionality in mind, as we've all mentioned before, um, as well as the ways that the, the pandemic has impacted um, girls and young women and youth, um, LGBTQI plus youth, um, young people with disabilities and Indigenous youth as well in this in the space of um, of you know gender and sex as well inter intersecting too. So um, hopefully my dream and goal, and uh, um, I hope governments take this on board, is to really engage in a data collection process that puts all of us youth that are represented here today as co-researchers in our own rights in obtaining this data, even primary research is supported by UN mechanisms. But most importantly, this data about us needs to be secured. And I think it is important that people don't see our identities as any less valuable because we are all powerful. And I think we've shown that um, and we're ready to be empowered, but we need that sex and gender specific data to show the disproportional impacts that youth and across all intersections are experiencing. Thank you. Valuable, and as has been said before, you are important. And that leads us to Eugene. This is a similar follow-up question. So given that we have so many stakeholders listening online, how can stakeholders address intersecting barriers or obstacles that young people face? Eugene. Um, I think that uh, we can all agree that um, many marginalized groups have been largely absent from the discussion table. So that, so the, uh, what I believe needs to happen is that stakeholders need, need to ensure that 
<coughs> you know, um, that youth um, is is um, is a part of the um, the uh, you know the planning, evaluation, and implementation of any future. Um, any future uh, resolutions, um, and I, th I think what 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 I would also like to note is that when marginalized groups um, demand uh, this kind of um, inclusion, acceptance, and accessibility, this is not they are not asking for a charity. This is their right. So that's my stance on the topic. Thank you, Eugene, and that's a, a very powerful stance and a very timely stance. <clears throat> we now have Tushar, and just because I, I like to add these little tidbits of information on our process, we have about 34 pages of, of notes that the youth participants and discussants wrote, and as I look at them through my three screens. So Tushar, the question I have is, what guidance do you have for governments regarding mental health support services for vulnerable youth? And should they partner with different types of groups or, or civil service? Do you have any advice for governments or civil society? To share the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Derek. Uh, from the previous experience over the past year, we have seen that how the LGBTIQ community members became more vulnerable to mental health disorder and there was no support from the government. So from my part, I would say uh, to the government that they should establish one-stop mental health support system um, especially for the vulnerable youths during this pandemic. And I, I must uh, uh, agree with you that uh, they should also merge or tag or promote the various youth-led initiatives or civil society-run mental health service, services that are across the country so that they can reach the very grassroots level youths to tackle this pandemic and improve everyone's mental health. Uh, amazing, very succinct, and that was a, a bullet point. Again, our, our youth discussions are amazing. And the next question is for Ms. Fiona McCluney. From as a UN uh, representing the UN, uh, from a country perspective, are there places for youth within the UN generally, and can their voice be heard within the UN system? I know this isn't an easy question. Huge question. Thank you, Derek. And two minutes to answer it. And no, I, I think um, there's space. I mean, we, we, we're, a, we're, a, we're a, a, a multiple group of, of UN agencies. We have lots of different strengths and weaknesses. We talk to different issues. And in each of those issues, there's a youth element. There's a youth element in terms of training. There's a youth element in terms of child rights with UNICEF. There's a youth element in terms of looking at green economy, green recovery um, uh, solutions. And I think it's it's incumbent on us to make the space for, their, for that voice to be heard. We also have tools. We have a UN Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework. It's a planning framework. We prepare it every five years. And it's a more formal space where we can get youth views incorporated. I mentioned Albania, you know, there's 14 um, youth representatives. We also had, they also did a survey on our behalf and then they came to talk to the UN country team heads of agencies and represent their views. So there's always a space. It takes time and it takes some energy and it takes um, a commitment. But I think there's, there, there is lots of scope and I think it's incumbent on us to do it. And also not treat youth as a homogenous group. Recognize the intersectionalities and find spaces where people can comfortably bring forward their views and ideas. Thank you for this session. And I want to thank you. I would also say during our meetings, during the practice, how you gave space and you held space for youth discussions as well. So you really embodied that practice as well as you listened and you took amazing notes and you brought that to our plenary today. So again, I want to thank you for, for that. Our, our next speaker, I have a question, is for Alba Voranica. And this is another general question. How can we center the experiences of indigenous youth in terms of how can they be part or be part of decision processes? Alba Voranica. Muchas gracias. Many thanks indeed, Derek. In my view, it's important that young indigenous people continue working together 
so that we can ensure that we are included in all decision-making fora. I also wish to take this opportunity to emphasize to our authorities that we need to be taken into account, that we need to participate in a genuine fashion in all decision-making spaces. We're working within our local organizations, but it is also important that we form part of the spaces within the Congress, for example, within the executive branch, within the judicial branch, so that we can participate in a genuine, tangible fashion. It's important that our fights cross community borders and so so that it's ultimately um, more possible to achieve the SDGs. Our ancestral knowledge, our indigenous knowledge needs to be taken into account and recognized because otherwise it will be illogical to continue fighting if we're not really taken on board by our national authorities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, amazing words and, and very succinct. Uh, then our next speaker, Linda, we were doing research and I've learned that you're preparing work on the Universal Periodic Review of Human Rights in Tunisia for 2022. My question is, can you give advice to other young people about other young people from vulnerable groups or young people in general, how they can be meaningfully engaged with the universal public abuse of human rights. Linda. Thank you for uh, this important question uh, there. I think the importance of the vulnerable young people contribution in the universal periodic review lies in their understanding of their problems so they will evoke unspoken matters and introduce a new vision i think the significant participation of them in this process represents in making the review written by them because they are the most ones who can feel their problems and to let them get a safe space to fight their own rights follow with that personally I will evoke women's uh, rights because I am aware about what, what can women suffer in a conservative society. It remains to say uh, that it's so effective that the Universal Periodic Review be written by the com communities concerned of the problem, but these young people need training and budget and, uh, and knowledge framework to succeed in building a strong review. Wish us a good luck. Thank you. And I want to thank you for that advice and just to highlight that the different types of knowledges that the, the youth uh, participants have is amazing. And I want to thank everyone for sharing that. For our, our final question is for women. And this is a question that some of the youth discussants had was, how will you continue working on leaving no youth behind and then addressing protection concerns as they arise? Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, let me, I mean, I just wanted to mention that in my the last report that I presented to the, to the Human Rights Council, I stressed that uh, space must be created uh, for young people to participate in shaping their own future. And, and, and the discussion of the future agenda must also be focused on addressing the challenges that young people face in exercising their right to freedom of peaceful assembly and association. And I think that the restriction placed on young vulnerable, particular young vulnerable groups to mobilize and exercise their right to peaceful assembly and of association can have a negative impact on the achievement of the SDGs. When they cannot advocate for better education, better environments, a more equal and peaceful society, we all lose. And the 2030 agenda also loses. You will agree with me. I'm, a special, I'm, I'm especially concerned uh, about the, uh, the digital divide that continue to exclude young people, in particular those working on rural area uh, and also with disabilities, and other from, from public participation. They have uh, been uh, disproportionately impacted by the reliance of digital tools during COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as for the future, you ask me, 
uh, I plan to continue to advocate for transparent and inclusive participation and consultation in consultation with the, the young people in the process of achieving SDGs. I will engage with government to ensure that young people are included. Uh, it is also important for me also to continue to consult uh, young group people and women, indigenous, uh, displaced uh, youth uh, population and disabilities also, the group, uh, uh, youth population also in developing my report because the, my reports also deal with how people can organize themselves and if those groups are able to organize themselves and to tackle their own future, we can also uh, achieve uh, the, 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 the 2030 agenda because the 2030 agenda, as you, 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 you will see, is focused on people participation, it's focused on be ensuring that the people are taken in account. And I, I will also continue to cooperate with, um, you know, you also ask in, in terms of the protection, protection issue. We know that within the UN, we have also several mechanisms, uh, including also the, 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 the uh, uh, Assistant Secretary General mandate, which is to receive any kind of uh, cases of reprisal that people face, and also to convene this message to the, to, the, to the Human Rights Council, and also call state to remedy on this situation. And also young people can also use my mandate to convene such message, and when we receive information, like this forum where you are engaging, if you are, you are for example, threatened, or if you are repressed because you participate to the, this uh, uh, UN forum, you can also call us because the participation of the young people in the debate at the international level, local level is important. And we should be able also to create this conducive space for young people. And my mandate is still open to continue to promote the voice of the young people and also to ensure also that uh, um, the future of our planet the future of, of uh, 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 this, uh, uh, this world, which is young people, can be secured through the participation of the young people. Again, thank you. And, and that was really an invitation to our, our youth participants and also youth around the world. And that was a beautiful invitation to be involved with human mechanisms with this important work. Again, thank you for your time. I would like to give the floor to H.G. Karras for his closing remarks and to wrap everything up from the things that he heard today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Derek. Uh, and first, let me thank the speakers. It's been an amazing session. I'm sure I'm not the only one who felt the energy and the dedication that our speakers have, have put into evidence today. I am taking away a lot from this session. I can already see how we in the UN can take on board several of the recommendations that the young people have made today. For example, it was clear that we need to strengthen multilateral processes and the intergenerational dialogue in order to effectively advocate with and for youth in vulnerable situations. As a concrete way to make this happen, I've heard that we need to significantly improve our collaboration with youth of intersecting identities so that they can provide feedback on the current mechanisms that impact them. Again, it's a question in many respects of them realizing their rights. We're not doing them favors. I also heard a strong call to close the data gap, to have a more detailed understanding of the challenges that are linked to intersecting vulnerabilities. Eugene said it in a very compelling way, data collection helps visibility. Having disaggregated data, as Angelica pointed out, would help us to design impactful interventions and develop effective policy guidance. I've heard speakers call for an initiative to obtain data relating to the social issues that are exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic for all youth. The issue of youth mental health also came up in some detail, including in the context of supporting youth who are mobilizing at the local and national levels and calling for the co-design of mental health strategies and interventions that would truly respond to the needs of all youth. For your information, we in UNDESA, we're currently working on the next edition of the World Youth Report, which is focusing on youth mental health and well-being. This upcoming report, which focuses specifically on the social determinants of mental health that Angelica referred to, is being prepared in very close collaboration and consultation with young people. It will improve our collective understanding of the specificities of youth mental health and well-being, and it is based on multiple testimonials of the experience of young people living with these different vulnerabilities, both pre 
and post-COVID. We've also heard a lot about the need to leverage all knowledge and strategies, including those created by indigenous peoples in the fight against climate change and against poverty and for overall development. That came through clearly in this session. Alba's testimony made it painfully clear that indigenous communities are being particularly affected by climate change, by the pandemic, and yet we do not sufficiently recognize the effective leadership role that they can play in helping to address a number of these complex issues that we face today. We all need to do a much better job at consulting and including Indigenous youth. Today's session demonstrates that there's no single approach to our work on leaving no one behind, leaving no youth behind. It's imperative for us to attentively listen to young people in vulnerable and marginal situations so that we can better understand and respond to their needs and make that a, an integral part of our policies. In parallel to this, we need to collectively invest in addressing the root causes that contribute to youth vulnerabilities. To do so, we need to be honest, responsive and accountable. And we also need to be bold and resilient. Bold, like the inspiring young people we've listened to today. I thank you very much for sharing your wisdom, your ideas, your experiences, as well as a very clear message that the status quo simply will not work anymore. We've heard you loud and clear, and the ball is now in our court. To close, I'd like to thank the many partners who've worked closely together to make this event today possible. In alphabetical order, these partners include the Major Group on Children and Youth, the MGCY, the International Coordination Meeting on, of Youth Organizations, ICMEO, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the Office of the Secretary General's Envoy on Youth, the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations, the UN Development Programme, the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, the Division for Inclusive Social Development, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, and UN Women. I also need to thank our outstanding moderator, Derek Leon Washington, who has so skillfully helped us to navigate this very full and very complex session. Very, very well done, Derek. And I hand it back to you. With my thanks and i, I want to thank you for again for being present during this whole plenary and also calling participants by name as well and that shows that you were listening and that the un and member states are listening as well again thank you everyone moving forward step by step in dialogue in a conversational style in conversation i would like to give the floor to the next panel the next um, important work Reflecting back and looking forward, celebrating a decade of youth form and the start of a decade of action. Again, thank you, everyone. Adelante. Uh, excellencies, distinguished delegates, uh, youth participants, I'm pleased to welcome you to this uh, plenary session of the ECOSOC Youth Forum on reflecting back and looking forward, celebrating a decade of Youth Forum and the start of the decade of action. This session will comprise thoughts on strategic opportunities for youth to influence United Nations processes and debates as well as perspectives on what to expect and, and to be hopeful for the next 75 years of the United Nations. What the young people want to see as well as how they can be a part of it. I would like to welcome the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Her Excellency Amina Muhammad and the United Nations Secretary General's Envoy on Youth, Ms. Jayatma Vikramanayake, as well as youth representatives, Ms. Dylan S.G. Koch, United Nations Youth Champion for Disarmament, Mr. Abdullah al Kafaji, Liaison Officer for Medical Education Issues at the International Federation of Medical Students Associations, and Ms. Mariana Vasconcelos, co-founder and chief executive officer of AgroSmart. I now invite 
the United Nations Secretary General's Envoy on Youth, Ms. Jayatma Vikramanayake, to begin this conversation. You have to talk, Ms. Jayatma. Thank you very much for that introduction, Mr. President. And welcome, everyone, to the final plenary segment of the 10th Ikasuk Youth Forum. Can you believe it? We've spent two days together, and we are almost at the end. We've spent the last two days exploring different facets of achieving the SDGs, and it only seems fitting that for the final segment, we are joining youth together in conversation with um, someone who I think lives and breathes SDGs, the UN's Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed. Now, before we jump into this session, I would like to draw your attention to the chat where we have just shared a link to a poll. We would love for everyone in the audience to be a part of this conversation. So please click the link and share your thoughts with us. So click the link, go to the poll and share your thoughts with us because we will be bringing in your ideas into this conversation at a later point. So for today, we are trying something a little different. It's not going to be statements one after one. It's going to be something called a fishbowl exercise. For this, we will eavesdrop on a conversation between three young people, three young activists, and then these three young people will be joined by the Deputy Secretary General to reflect and elaborate on their methodologies for the achievement of the SDGs. Now, let's first watch the video. Hi everyone, my name is Mariana. I'm Brazilian, I'm daughter of farmers. And today I work using technology to make agriculture more productive, sustainable, and climate resilient. Hi everyone, my name is Dilan and I'm from Turkey. I'm currently located in New Haven, pursuing a master's in global affairs at Yale University. I'm a musician and have been playing the cello for 10 years. And my aim is to promote the role of arts and the art society to contribute to the achievement of SDGs. Hello everyone, my name is Abdullah. I come from Iraq. I'm a final year medical student, and I'm also the Regional Officer for Medical Education Issues at IFMSA, and I work in medical education and healthcare. I work on integrating the SDGs in education in order to promote a more sustainable world. Well, it's so nice that we come from such different backgrounds and countries and areas of study that I'm really curious to understand better the approach you guys are taking to achieve the SDGs. So Dylan, tell us a little bit more on like how including art and how art can support the SDGs. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question. Thank you, Mariana. Um, I believe that although facts, science and policy are crucial to contribute to SDGs, like we need scientists and policymakers to combat climate change and its impacts and to promote and to promote peace and security for sustainable development. But I think that facts and policy alone often fail to make the necessary change and urgent action happen. Like we need a catalyst connecting hard facts and solutions with human awareness and action. We need inclusion and devotion to achieve the SDGs by 2030. And I know for a fact that arts can do that. With the power of music, I was able to tell a story and build an emotional connection with others to make even incremental changes in my community. I performed in fundraising concerts to help the refugee resettlement, to advocate for human rights and gender equality in Turkey. And I think that if I can raise awareness and improve even one person's life, there's so much more we can do together as the whole art society to show the way to build a safer and more peaceful world for all through the achievement of the SDGs. So I'm also interested in what Abdullah thinks. So let's look at uh, from a health perspective. We know that climate change is causing up to 250,000 deaths by the year 2030. On the other hand, only 15% of the world's medical schools have formal education about climate change. So let's do this. Let's advocate for integration of climate change in medical curricula. Let's advocate for integration of SDGs in primary, secondary, and even tertiary curricula. We integrate it with our education. We have a more competent health worker that is fully aware, fully informed, and able to make the change. 
Well, that's really nice, Abdullah, because like as climate change is affecting health and it's your perspective to it. In my case, climate change is affecting a lot of agriculture and our ability to feed the world, right? So in our case, like we are helping farmers to understand better the crops with sensors and, and data, even when there is no internet in the field. So we use that to support the decision making and therefore we can save water, like with a better irrigation management, we were able to save more than 41 billion uh, liters of water in the past years. We are able to reduce greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions uh, by helping them to do better like planning on their operations, using less inputs and so on, and connecting them with the whole supply chain. So uh, we use the same data to support the zero hunger and be able to adapt to climate change so we will continue to produce. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate your contributions. Um, Abdullah, you mentioned the importance of youth mobilization to contribute to SDGs. I wanted to ask you, both of you, do you think that young people are being effectively engaged in the 2030 agenda? And what do you think is the greatest challenge to effectively engage with the youth? That's a great question, Dylan. Um, after five years of implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, and even before, since we had the Millennial Development Goals, Youth have been increasingly engaged in, 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 in global governance, in UN structures. Uh, we see that the number of youth delegates to UN meetings are increasing every year and they are uh, participating, they're engaging. And the COVID-19 pandemic with, with more reliance on, the, on technology and the virtual world have proved us that it's not necessary anymore for you to be, let's say, an adult or an old person so that you can make change. So I think a lot have been made uh there are some good success stories there have been some achievements but for the upcoming 10 years there is still a lot of improvement to be made there is still a room for improvement and i'm also curious to know what is mariana's perspective on this question well for me like i think i got to know the sdgs very late in life already like in my work life and it would be great to got to know before i would like to have seen that schools earlier in life so we can actually frame our mindset to create things to impact in my case it was like moved by entrepreneurship like by need and wanting to innovate and then discovering that our innovation could cause impact and i think if we introduce that to youth early in the days like and, and together the same way as we are thinking that everyone should code when they're seven it's like everyone should know about the sdgs when they're seven so whatever they build they build already thinking on how they will impact the world what about you Dylan? yeah i completely agree with both of you and building on what you said i think that a minority of young people are being effectively engaged in the 2030 agenda but obviously it's not sufficient and I believe that like SDG engagement is relatively strong at the national and institutional level, but relatively weak at the individual and community level, because I think especially young people perceive these issues so complex and high level that like only the government, international organizations and professionals should work on these issues. There's a tendency among young people to think that it does not really concern me. And even if it did, what power do I have to make a change? So I think, this is a big barrier to youth engagement. And another one is that SDGs are away from the public discourse, especially in the developing and underdeveloped countries. Like what we should do is like, we should move this issue to the public discourse urgently, because as you mentioned, this concerns each one of us, regardless of our age, what we do and where we are from. It's not a state level or like a regional issue, but it's a universal one and it's a very urgent one because you are very active youth advocates and and you have been excelling in your field so uh i wanted to ask what are your recommendations uh that you would like to make to the united nations leadership to better engage youth in in monitoring review and acceleration of the implementation of the sdgs and the 2030 agenda well my recommendation in line with what i, I said in the question before would be that they invest in the early childhood education around the sdgs so it can actually reach a larger number of people very early on. And I think perhaps a better communication with other sectors such as technology innovation. I think there are so many great people out there and they're putting their minds to, to think and create new things. And it would be great that like every business should be a social business. And that's where I think we are moving towards now with the corporate strategies and the SG. 
but it would be great to see that uh, replicating what we are seeing the corporate agenda after the pandemic and so on with youth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my answer to, to this question is actually coming from the UN itself. So I am one of the UN Youth Champions for Disarmament. And I think if the UN increases such initiatives like UN Youth Champions for Disarmament, it would be like a really like a big step towards a meaningful engagement of youth with the SDGs because these types of initiatives enable youth to raise their voices and have a presence in these global issues especially regarding a topic that is so vital to achieving SDGs, which is disarmament, because all of us know that we cannot have development without secure communities. So I think this UN Youth Champion for Disarmament Initiative could be an example of the for the UN leadership to better engage with the youth. What about you, Abdullah? What do you think? I think until the modern day, young people are still struggling with tokenism and, and the involvement cultures in general uh, in, in their home countries. Uh, so I think the best contribution or the biggest support that the UN can do for those young people is to influence structure policies and conditions towards member states and partner organizations to meaningfully engage youth and try as much as possible to eliminate tokenism. Hearing you guys uh talk just makes me very inspired and i think like we really need to invest that in having role models that other youth can look at and know that they can also make a change that it doesn't take too much and you can be everywhere in the world so i feel really inspired by your stories thank you yeah absolutely i'm i, I share your opinion and this conversation itself gave me hope and i want to echo what you said that even it's like a long and challenging way that the way to achieve the SDGs, but I think with the effective youth engagement and leadership, we can absolutely do it by 2030. Uh, we are the young, we have voices, we want to be heard, we want to be uh, full partners, we want to be integrated uh, in decision-making uh, strategies and implementation, evaluation and review. Um, we have the capacity, we have the knowledge, uh, and we can make the change and we will be the future leaders towards achieving the SDGs. Thank you very much, Abdullah, Mariana, and Dylan. I think you've shared a lot of interesting ideas and thoughts with us, particularly the importance of having SDG education, climate education in incorporated in the educational curriculums, arts for SDGs, climate, agriculture, technology intersection, how do we support young entrepreneurs to bring these um, different areas of work together, the progress on youth engagement on these issues and what more can the UN and national governments particularly do to empower young people to be equal partners in SDG implementation and review. Now I'd like to invite the Deputy Secretary General and the three of you back to the stage uh, to hear what the DSG thinks about these ideas that were discussed so eloquently by our young speakers. Okay, let's see. Can you see and hear me? No? No, they, they haven't brought you in yet. Okay. So you're like, you know, Holding room. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you are now. Oh, there I am. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Jasmine, can you hear and see me? I can hear and see you. <laughs> okay. okay, I don't know who else is supposed to hear and see me, but um, who am I speaking to? Is that um, Mariana? Yeah. Mariana, and then there is. Dylan, there is Abdullah, right? Yes. Great. Okay. At least I've got that right. <laughs> Fantastic. So I'm, I'm, am I to start now? I can't. This technology thing is way past me. So um, tell me, shall I go ahead and, and just... Yeah, you can go ahead. We are live. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, uh, thanking, you know, of course, Jay Athman, the president of ECOSOC, uh, to, to join this interactive session today. And I was looking through the program since yesterday, um, and it's really very exciting. I, I just wish I could have heard so much more. Um, and 10 years later, I think we really have moved. You've pushed um, the, the United Nations to uh, hear more of you and to, to, um, to
to certainly involve you more in, in this uh, town hall for youth. So initial reactions, I think from all three speakers, um, we've heard examples of youth action, of innovation to support the sustainable development goals. And I think on every issue that has crossed your desk, um, every challenge that the world uh, faces today, uh, you're clearly showing that you're leading the way. And, and I, I was listening to the end of uh, Abdullah's remarks about what you can do and should be allowed to do as, as leaders um, in the future. I, I think you're leading now. Um, you are bringing innovation. You're raising awareness and you are driving change, mobilizing and inspiring others. And you're holding people to account. And I know this because as a, as a minister, I had a fantastic young person who used to have an initiative that was called Follow the Money. Um, and, and I knew I was doing the right thing with money, but I needed his voice to see if others were doing the right thing with money. So really um, innovation, uh, creative about holding us to account. Um, and I think what we probably need to do is find better ways of bringing young people on board, uh, not just ticking the box, um, expanding and connecting the youth movement for SDGs, um, and, and probably you know, really looking at the restrictions that are on um, youth assembly and youth action. Um, creating conditions that allow ideas to reach the scale that the SDGs need, because this is a big agenda. This is not the MDGs where we only looked at the social side and we never looked at the systemic change that needed to happen for transformation. Um, and so I think that we will have to take a good look at what it means uh, for, for young people. We were young once, uh, but young people um, are mothers. Um, and uh, I think that you know in the future you will be me. Um, <laughs> as a grandmother, but I think it is the intergenerational uh, transition we need to look at right now and to have a, a very clear, um, meaningful um, interaction on how that will happen. It is about power, um, but the SDGs are incredibly, um, I think, robust framework. Everyone sees themselves in it, um, and, I, and I think that it, it, is, it is about collective responsibility as much as it is individually. Um, and if I am a little more specific, uh, Abdullah, your approach focusing on using education as a tool to raise awareness uh, about the, the SDGs among students, I think that's really important to contextualize it rather than just to teach it as a set of 17 goals and sustainable development. We have to make it real um, in people's um, own realities. And, and I think that that was really useful to hear you talk about a holistic approach to learning, which is what I hope we are doing when we're trying to reimagine education. Um, and the need to integrate climate um, and SDGs more broadly into curricula across the world. And that's quite, that's tough um, because I, I think even our teachers need to have an immersion in what that means in order to teach it. Um, agreeing, of course, that education is at the core uh, and a responsible citizenship is, is key for societal change. So again, back to individual and collective responsibilities um, and that you know, every single goal is special. Um, and I just think that when you pick up a goal like education, just refer to it as a docking station for the other 16. Because then you'll see how education works for every other goal, as I do with gender, uh, which is so important and, 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 and does the same thing. Um, I, I think you're um, underscoring the uh, education crisis that we've had globally as a result of the pandemic um, is, is really... It's a huge one. Young people have been disrupted and it's been very hard and difficult. I have a young uh, son who's at, at university and it's really hard uh, to do this um, without human interaction. And, and, and uh, what's even, I think, more um, critical perhaps is that how about those who are going to risk not going back, particularly um, our women and girls? Um, you did say if we didn't invest in education as part of our COVID-19 recovery, we won't achieve the uh, SDGs. And, failing an entire generation, but I think we'll also be failing future generations because the foundation will be weak. So just to add to that, um, you also mentioned 2030 agenda is universal. And I, I believe you're completely right about that, regardless of age is, is, is what you had said. But um, more importantly, it is that we learned from the COVID uh, pandemic how universal this agenda is. Everyone suffered in, in, um, in one way or another um, as the pandemic hit health and socioeconomically. Mariana, you've also joined this collective action by adopting an approach that merges technology, entrepreneurship and agriculture to advance the SDGs. Um, I'm very busy right now working on the Food Systems Summit that comes up in September, um, and that's really exciting. 
Um, and so I, I think that, you know, uh, here, uh, you know, for you using a strong, as a strong believer that we should use science, technology and innovation to make the change. Um, smarter, greener solutions to achieve the SDGs. Maybe I would add to that that, you know, once upon a time, someone said to me, the teachers and the farmers are a dying profession. Um, and it is because we don't engage or incentivize or make it an exciting career. But I think for the first time, science and technology is making um, agriculture incredibly interesting. The whole food system um, uh, uh, ecosystem is, 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 is really amazing. And it's uh, more so because we're now looking at greener solutions. Um, ongoing pandemic, you've, uh, you've alluded to us seeing the increased food insecurity and hunger. And I think that that's also um, you know, a huge, a huge lesson learned um, that our way of living, our destruction of the land, natural resources is making these pandemics so much more likely. Um, you talked about youth startups and entrepreneurs in the field of agriculture uh, that are needed uh, since achieving the SDGs, reducing poverty, achieving gender equality depends on progress in rural areas, absolutely. But also um, the, the synergy, I, I will add to that, uh, between the rural and the urban. Um, and then the strong engagement of, um, I, I mean, I, I certainly look forward to seeing your strong engagement. I think we already have. We made a condition to our food system summit that all the action tracks, instead of having co-leaders that were um, just, you know, one male, one female, one from the north, one from the south, we added three. And the third person was to be a young person. So I hope that you will grab that leadership um, and, and move forward really fast. Dylan, you've really creative and unique approach to achieving the SDGs and, and bringing peace um, uh, to our world. I also uh, believe that we need a driving and uniting force to accomplish the SDGs. And arts can certainly play a role by bringing us together, especially if we can raise community awareness, um, as you had mentioned. Arts and music, they touch people, um, hearts and minds, and they span across language and cultural barriers that inspire action and reach a, reach a wider audience. Um, my experience a couple of years ago, just in a stadium, I was sitting with some heads of state and government, and we were watching as a rapper came on stage. There were 40,000 people in the audience. And when that rapper spoke to them, everybody got up and made a lot of noise. And then when the president went down to speak to them, it was sort of like, we're in a school classroom. So, you know, really moving the message um, so that people carry it and act on it. Uh, that really has been at the heart of most movements for change. And I hope that you will, um, you know, again, leverage that again to spread the word. Um, communication and advocacy strategies are huge. So I have a, a question now for you um, uh, for, for this event. And I think what I would like to be, I, I am more curious to know, is that as we are coming, um, as we're coming out of this pandemic, we're still trying to respond, survive it. Uh, but as we come out of it and knowing fully well, whatever response we have now will determine the quality of the recovery. Um, what approaches are you looking at? What opportunities are you looking to profit from the tragedy of COVID in looking at perhaps leapfrogging um, for the SDGs? Do you see any opportunities from the pandemic and its crisis um, to move the SDGs forward? So maybe I start with uh, Mariana. Yes, uh, I don't know. Like I think perhaps we could start with Abdullah. So like I can add because usually his work has a lot of connection with mine. So perhaps if he starts, I can jump and connect to his points. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, that is actually a very good question and from a from a focus on education it's it's not a secret that COVID-19 has aggressively affected education worldwide and and the existing disparities that we have in quality equity and access to education have been widened however the time of COVID has also been the time for students and educators mm -hmm. to reflect assess and reevaluate the outcomes of their education the gaps in their curricula and the relevance of their educational objectives. And because we are closer more than ever to technology in today's world, I think uh, we are doing quite well investing in that. Uh, we're using technology to bring closer the voice of students. We are advocating for uh, 
meaningful student mm -hmm. engagement in, in, in education and educational management, in, in the social accountability of their education, in the accreditation and quality assurance of their education. And we're also partnering with stakeholders uh, and innovators who are helping us to renovate our educational tools. Uh, today, there are more than ever emerging educational startups, platforms, uh, technology that is uh, mitigating the gaps that we used to have in the, in the uh, pre-COVID world. And I firmly believe that if we succeed in joining forces and uh, work together, I think we can achieve a better education than the one that we used to have. Um, before COVID-19. So perhaps we can hear from Dylan as well. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Abdullah. Um, echoing kind of what you said, unfortunately, coronavirus has had a devastating impact on the arts sector and society in general. There's a lingering hiatus for the arts all around the world as the musicians and artists are not able to perform to an audience. Personally, I have used this time to reflect upon my work as a musician, to strengthen my connection with the arts community, and to find ways that I can contribute to the SDGs through virtual means. For example, with a composer friend, we performed and recorded a piece for a UN podcast aiming at bringing more young people to the discussion around disarmament. I also contacted artists and musicians and let them know about my work and ways for them to contribute to the SDGs through their own unique ways. Lastly, combining my work in the nuclear non-proliferation non field and also music, I started gauging interest in my close musician circle for a project aiming at establishing an orchestra to advocate for the global non-proliferation and disarmament norms through music. This project is still at a very early stage due to global pandemic, but I'm hoping that we will make concrete progress starting this summer. <clears throat> Once again, I strongly believe that the arts, and in my case, music, can act as an intermediary between facts and policy and human awareness and action. I believe that the arts community has so much more to do in helping the achievement of SDGs. And through communicating the urgent message and motivating the immediate action, and hopefully we will further this, this agenda during and after the global pandemic. Um, I'm curious to know what Mariana thinks about this issue. Well, in my case, regarding the food systems, like the pandemic raised the awareness, like we couldn't have a food crisis besides a health crisis, right? So everyone started thinking like how we can understand better the food supply chain, how we can trace it and have more transparency and have it to be more sustainable so we can feed everyone and can be resistant to future pandemics as well. So the farmers in the field with like uh, immigration issues, uh, social distancing, uh, lack of access to supply, roads interruptions, they were forced to speed up acceleration of the digital transformation. So in our case, like it was challenging, but it ended up being good. That like what we needed to do already so we could feed the world in 2050, so we can face climate change and so on, that is adopting data and having a better view of the food system so we can use that data to produce more at the same time we're more sustainable, like with the pandemic was accelerated. So like we saw many ag techs grow, besides the economic downside, there is still investments going on because the industry has shown itself to be uh, resilient. So I actually, I mean, I would love to get engaged in the food systems like uh, event in any way. And I would like to take the chance to ask you, like in, in your perspective, in this challenge time where we are faced the pandemic, what the UN could do to ensure that the young people are have the opportunity to get engaged in approaching the, in achieving the SDGs? Oh, great. Well, first, thank you, all of you. Um, uh, clear messages from you reimagining education, uh, music and arts being the language of peace and, and uh, of course, the food crisis and digital transformation. So that's a bit of leapfrogging with connectivity. Um, and absolutely, Mariana, I will make sure you are well and truly involved in the Food Systems Summit. First meeting Italy and the second one in New York. Um, well, for us, I think it's clear that we can't achieve the SDGs without young people. Um, and it's not doing it for you, it's doing it with you. And so for the UN, looking at the first stock taking report on the implementation of the youth strategy, I think I see three concrete areas where we need to improve our engagement uh, with young people um, uh, to achieve the SDGs and, you know, making it clear that for me, the, the, the biggest um, opportunity is at the country level where we have the largest footprint across uh, over 130 countries. 
So first, I would say improving how we work with young people. Um, and while we talk a lot about youth-led solutions, it's clear we're not as good as actually supporting them um, and supporting uh, youth-led civil society organizations. And it's an area where I think we could do much more to um, improve that. The recent um, meeting in Mexico uh, with young people and women uh, was, was, a, was a good example of how we're getting better at it, but we still have a way to go. Um, and so that would be the first. The second, actually listening uh, to young people. I think everyone's always in a hurry and we don't take the time to listen. So I think that's that's gonna be really import, important. Uh, we have lots of engagement opportunities like this one, um, but we need to talk less, uh, perhaps respond uh, to, to what we're hearing um, uh, as we listen to what you're saying. Um, and, and I think that we, we, we need to make sure that uh, we're living up to your expectations, not just ours. I think that's really important, and especially at country, country level. The third, engaging with the, with the many faces of young people, not generic. Um, so young people are brothers and sisters. Uh, they're also fathers and mothers. Um, and we have young people from different races, sexualities, uh, different political outlooks. Um, uh, there are people with smartphones and people mining the minerals for smartphones. Uh, so, you know, driving the SDGs, we need to embrace all young people and, and to really encourage that peer interaction, not just with what you are able uh, to go to online because you choose to be in that chat room or with those podcasts, but across outside of that to those that are part of your constituency, but not may not be uh, where you are. Um, and, and I think that this is we need to do more of that. And it, it does mean going beyond our comfort zones leveraging different tools to engage marginalized youth on, on their terms and taking the pulse of young people, not just once a year, but on an ongoing basis. We need to know how to connect with what's happening, feeling the pulse um, of, of that and responding um, in, in, I think, in real time. Um, yeah, so that's, that's really what I think. Those three, uh, those three spaces need to be strengthened um, and particularly at country level. They might, I think, I mean, are we, how far are we in this conversation? Because I didn't want to leave without, um, oops, I think everybody's gone. I hear this, this platform is a bit tricky because only a limited number of people can be on the screen at the same time. So I think they had to take the previous speakers out in order to bring me in. But here I am. And um, I just wanted to share this. Before you came on board, we shared a poll on the live chat where about 19,000 young people are watching us online. And we asked them about the approaches that Abdullah, Mariana, and Dylan were sharing and the top-ranking approach that many of our viewers are saying that they are prioritizing is investing in education to achieve the SDGs in both formal info and informal education. And then that is followed by using social media as a, another tool to promote SDGs coming out of the COVID-19 crisis and using innovation and technology. And then using arts as catalyst ranks as third. So it's very clear that many of the young people who are joining us today from around the world are using approaches very similar to that of Abdullah, Mariana, and Dylan, and the support that you mentioned that the UN will be extending to them also in the context of the youth strategy is very timely and important. Thank you very much, DSG, for your time and joining us for the final plenary segment of the Kosok Youth Forum. And now it's my honor to pass the floor back to the President of the Economic and Social Council. Thank you very much. I'd like to... Uh, I'd like to thank uh, a distinguished uh, Deputy Secretary General uh, and the uh, Secretary General's envoy, as well as our youth participants, uh, for that enlightening conversation and for sharing uh, the thoughts and perspectives on strategic opportunities for youth to 
guide the debate and expectations for the future uh, as we come uh, to the closing part of uh, this year's Youth Forum. Uh, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, youth participants, I would now like to invite the Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs, Mr. Liu Zhenmin, to make a closing statement. You have the floor. Mr. President of ACASOC, Your Excellency, Ambassador Akram, distinguished delegates, and young colleagues, I wish to command Ambassador Akram for organizing and hosting such an impressive youth forum on its 10th anniversary. Although we did not meet in person, the level of engagement in this youth forum is remarkably high. Meeting virtually has allowed the expansion of this space for dialogue with you. We now see the potential for further engagement to grow steadily and become more diverse every year. I also thank the Secretary General's envoy and youth, our dear friend and collaborator who has worked intensely with DESA in organizing this annual dialogue with youth and other stakeholders. My appreciation also goes to the major group for children and youth and the International Coordination Meeting of Youth Organizations for their valuable support. Equally important is the need to recognize the active and continuous engagement of the dozens of EU entities, members of the interagency network and youth development in organization of the various sessions. Your work to advance the effectiveness of the UN's work in youth development is bearing fruit every day. As the co-chair for the network, DESA is posed to mainstream your voices into the new work across all pillars and continents. And my warmest thanks to all the youth who have participated in the youth forum over the past two days. The United Nations want to hear from you. Without your participation, our efforts to build a sustainable and resilient future will be in vain. Dear young friends, the COVID-19 pandemic has emerged at a critical time in your own development. You have already heard during the discussions of the central importance of well-being and mental health to COVID-19 response and recovery. The upcoming 2022 World Youth Report addresses various shortcomings leading to gaps in mental health services and support to young people, particularly the most vulnerable. The policy recommendations to address these gaps will be shared with your governments and other stakeholders for implementation. As we look to the decade of action, we are aware that change is happening right now. And you are leading that change. You are at the forefront of climate action for a healthy planet. You are innovating and creating green jobs. And you are offering sustainable solutions on how cities, companies, and your fellow citizens can improve the quality of life in their community. Many of you are concerned with the trends in your home countries and regions towards nationalism, intolerance, and isolationism. But you are also often leading the fight for equality and taking a stand for inclusion and important issues such as racism, gender equality, diversity, and the rights of minorities, including indigenous peoples, persons with disabilities, and people on the move. We stand with you and want to make sure that your voices are heard. 
the underrepresentation of youth in political processes must be addressed. We know that structural barriers and biases, such as perceived experiences, a lack of supportive social networks, or insufficient financial resources can be overcome. We can see from your leadership roles in climate action and addressing social injustice that you are interested in participating in the political process. Dear young colleagues, we also understand that your voices need to be heard in a more meaningful manner here at the United Nations on issues crucial to peace and sustainable development. We need to consider ways to strengthen youth engagement in intergovernmental processes as a part of reinvigorated multilateralism. This will be critical to fostering legitimacy and restoring trust among youth. Together, we need to address the short and long-term responses to COVID-19 and other complex national and global challenges. We will not leave you behind. Your competence and expertise, your passion and vision for a sustainable future will help us build a global movement of implementation. We will stand with you as a generation who will bring SDGs home in 2030. Count on myself and my department, UNDESA, among your supporters and partners, and I invite you to continue to share your ideas with us through youth networks and platforms. Together, we can move the youth and sustainable development agenda forward. I thank you. The, I thank the distinguished Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs, uh, Mr. Liu Jianmin, for that uh, closing statement. I would now like to invite uh, two inspiring young sisters who are the founders of Bye Bye Plastic Bags and Utopia, Miss Milati Vizin and Miss Isabel Vizin, to make a joint closing statement. You have the floor. Thank you so much. The world is changing fast, faster than we want. And that's why we're very excited to be joining you virtually from Bali, Indonesia. For the last two days, we know you have been listening to many statements and stories, but we know that change is still happening too slowly. Nobody would have thought one and a half years ago that we would become experts on online meetings and that we would talk to each other like this from different continents and from different time zones. But we as youth know that we need to stand up. We need to see stronger commitments from those in positions of power. No more empty promises. We want action. We are living in a time where we can no longer sit on the sidelines. We have to wake up. And that starts with all of you here today. Our story started eight years ago. And if there's one thing that we have learned, it is that change does not happen overnight. It takes a lot of courage, persistence, and grit and of course, community. We as youth urge you to do your duty urgently, and we are here to help because we can. So without further ado, we would like to share our learnings with you now. Please play our video. For decades, humanity has hid behind, it is progress. For decades, you have ignored all science and signs because economic growth had priority. For the last few decades, you have been talking, meeting after meeting, and making unclear promises in a future that is too far away. So we do not have the luxury of time. We do not have the luxury to wait until we are grown up for action to happen. Every day, we do not ask and push you to act on change. We are losing our future and the future of all lives on our planet as we know it. Every day we are not marching, protesting, or acting ourselves. We are losing a future we want to be a part of. So do not tell us we are too young or we don't understand, because we do. 
just in a different way and through a different lens. Plastic pollution is the problem we decided to do something about back in 2013, at the ages of 10 and 12 years old on our home island of Bali. With no business plan or agenda, we just started. It took us seven years, but with the help of many like-minded, we championed the ban against single-use plastic items like the bag, straws, and styrofoam. Our journey as young activists has been filled with many life lessons, lessons a normal textbook could never have taught us. And some of the most important lessons we've learned, we would like to share here with you today. Lesson number one, you need to have a team. You cannot do it on your own. Today, Bye Bye Plastic Bags can be found in 57 locations in all corners of the world, all led by other young people. Yes, true collaboration and partnerships are the key to success. Two, a clear vision and goal, a target you can reach. And well, the rest is really never give up, ever. Once you've mastered those two lessons, you, we, the youth, are unstoppable. We have spoken to over half a million students and youth globally, often online. Anywhere and always, there was one question. How can I do what you do? And that led us to create Utopia, as we believe you all can do what we do. Utopia is all about youth empowerment and reaches the tools and support from young change makers to the rising youth. We believe that every young person can be a change maker. We know we are not alone. You are not alone. Our generation has the ability to accelerate that much needed change. We see challenges as opportunity. We turn obstacles into innovation. We can change any linear system into a circular one. We youth have the clear vision of the systemic change that needs to happen. As we are, are serious, serious about, about change. The Sustainable Development Goals were created in 2015 to help and guide us reach a sustainable future and solve issues in 17 different areas. A better and sustainable future for all without leaving anybody behind to make the problems and issues understandable and the solutions workable. The SDGs provide a clear vision and an answer to many difficult questions like the how, the what, and the why. Imagine, just for a moment, that we at all levels of the global community, leadership and governments, would accelerate change and commit to solve all the issues of the 17 SDG goals and leave nobody behind. This is the world we would see. But again, there has been a slow start to reach this. Too many excuses, loopholes, and loose commitments on all levels. Yes, on all levels. But change is not happening fast enough. And that is where we come in. We are fast thinkers and action driven. We carry no double agenda, hidden numbers, or old luggage other than to work hard for our future. We are not hindered by any limitations. And as Greta recently stated, we are not here to make any deals or to negotiate. In 2018, His Excellency, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres made a statement to work more closely with youth and to get more young people involved. But is it really happening? Or are we as youth still only being seen as inspiration and being told to wait until it's our turn later? We have to start treating this emergency as an emergency that has all of our attention and priority so we can create and work towards a vision for 2030 and beyond. We cannot wait until we have graduated high school or gotten our degree. And that's why you see young people getting involved and act at a younger and younger age. You cannot ignore us anymore. Change is already here. Us kids may only be 25% of the world's population, but we are. 100% of the future. I thank uh, Ms. Melati Lishchen and Ms. Isabel Lishchen for their statement. I would also like to take this opportunity to congratulate them on their initiatives and to wish them all success uh, in the continuing endeavors. I would now like to invite the United Nations Secretary General's Envoy of Youth, Ms. Jayatama Vikramaneyake, to make a closing statement. You have to. 
Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I'm not sure if I can quite top uh, Melati and Isabel's intervention. It was so powerful and, and they spoke truth to power. Um, and I think that's the spirit that we've been seeing in the last two days on this online space from these conversations to the breakout sessions to social media where young people from around the world were telling us at the UN what they aspire for their future and also what they are doing, not passively waiting, what they're actively doing today to achieve that future that they're dreaming for. So excellencies, distinguished guests, my fellow young people, I hope all of you are as proud and excited as I am today to have history made together over the past two days. Over 19,000 young people have joined us from 100, over 190 countries, making this ECOSOC Youth Forum not only the largest, but also the most inclusive and diverse gathering of young people ever at the United Nations. This is no small feat. And through your active participation, you were all a critical part in making this happen. I want to also recognize the over 60 high level government representatives, including head of state, vice presidents, ministers, and head of national youth agencies who participated in sessions throughout the youth forum and the countless other youth-led and youth-focused organizations, civil society partners, international organizations, UN entities, private sector representatives, and other stakeholders who joined us for the Youth Forum this year. Thank you for showing up to these important conversations. I want to especially thank the organizers and the participants of the breakout sessions, the side events, all of your efforts contributed to making this forum a success. It's incredible to think that in a year when everything went virtual and that we are all quite honestly suffering from Zoom fatigue, we were able to still collectively convene over 50 side events on a variety of issues related to young people. A true testament to the steadily growing interest in and influence of youth voices here at the United Nations. Your active engagement is just as important in ensuring that the world works effectively with and for youth in delivering the 2030 agenda. But this right now, this isn't the end, it's only the beginning. As we look ahead in the decade of action to deliver on the sustainable development goals and as we aim to recover better and greener in response to COVID-19, it's imperative that our new normal looks more like the world young people believe in, dream about and fight for than the one we live in today. A world that is more sustainable, a world that is just and equal and fair for all people and a world that no one is left behind. Dear friends, as it was said many times at this forum in the last two days, unlike any other generation before, young people today face a future characterized by intersecting and complex crises with potentially irreversible long-term consequences, including the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the climate crisis, widening inequalities, and systemic and persistent discrimination, among others. Participants of the forum highlighted that this is why more than ever we need intergenerational partnerships, not only to respond to the challenges of the present, but to recover from the mistakes of the past and build forward a better future for all of us. With this in mind, allow me to put forth a few concrete recommendations stemming from your discussions at the forum during the past two days. First, we need to build strong relationships with young people to regain their trust in institutions. Young people must be full-fledged partners in SDG implementation and review. I urge all of you to recognize and value young people's expertise and vision when designing, implementing, and reporting on comprehensive youth policies. Those policies could be your policies to achieve the roadmap of the SDGs. Young people must also be meaningfully engaged, not only on youth-related issues, but on all matters related to the lives of young people, including peace and security, human rights, sustainable development, climate action, and many others. 
This means organizing consistent consultations with young people with a systemic follow-up plan and communications, while also monitoring the implementation of young people's recommendations, including in relation to the voluntary national reviews, the universal periodic reviews, and other reporting mechanisms that member states adhere to. Second, there is a need to ensure that young people are safe when exercising their rights and engaging in civic space and political processes. If there was one common thread across the conversations at this forum, it is young people calling for safer environment for them to express themselves. It's been particularly concerning to hear about the increasing repression of youth who are peacefully exercising their rights to freedom of assembly and freedom of expression to promote human rights and democracy in their countries. In an increasing number of cases, young people are being exposed to brutality, repression and violence simply because they're speaking truth and simply because they're young. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated issues of shrinking civic space that often affects young people the most. It's imperative that we invest in, strengthen and finance young people's networks and ensure time, age and gender sensitive responses to young people's threats to safety. This is fundamental to ensuring that there are safe, conducive environments for young people to express their voices safely and that they can be heard. Lastly, we need to make sure that we put our money where our mouth is and our investments are bold, future-proof and evidence-based. As we rebuild from COVID and look to address the stark inequalities that the pandemic has exasperated and laid bare, we have a unique opportunity to rebuild a more resilient and more sustainable future, a greener future. For that, we need investments in education for sustainable development, green jobs for youth, renewable energies, safe digital transformation, and youth-led climate action solutions. There's no shortage of youth-led innovations out there. We just need to ensure that they are found and that they're adequately resourced and supported. I'm sure that I'm not alone in feeling that the last two days have been a truly rewarding experience. I thank the president of ICOSOC and the ICOSOC Bureau for their guidance and support for this convening. I also thank the co-organizers of this virtual ICOSOC Youth Forum, the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, the Interagency Network on Youth Development, Major Group for Children and Youth, International Coordination Meeting of Youth Organizations, and my own team who have worked tirelessly to make this happen. The forum would likewise not have been possible without the valuable support from our UN colleagues from the Department of Global Communications, Department of General Assembly and Conference Management, and the Office of Information and Communication Technologies. And a special thanks to our interpreters and closed captioning services who have helped to ensure, and sign language interpreters, who have helped ensure that this year's event was one of the most inclusive events we have had yet. A huge thanks again, and I cannot possibly say in enough words to my very own team. Team Oske, you are amazing, wonderful, committed. Thank you for all the efforts you put into making this forum success behind the scenes. I'm so lucky to have a team like you who are so committed to push the youth agenda against any and every obstacle along the way. Your ideas, recommendations, dear young people, your frustrations, your criticisms, your feedback has been heard. And I commit to you today that they will be taken into account in the UN's work. And I will personally make sure that I push for the follow-up of those recommendations. You have made this 10th anniversary ECOSOC Youth Forum a historic and auspicious moment for young people everywhere. Thank you for your contributions. I would like to thank the Secretary General's Envoy and Youth for, for her um, important closing remarks and especially for the concrete recommendations for further action, uh, which she has listed and which no doubt will guide the efforts of the United Nations in, in the future. Uh, excellencies, uh, distinguished colleagues, uh, distinguished youth participants, <clears throat> these two days have been a breath of fresh air uh, in the environment of the United Nations. We have heard the voices and vision of young people from all parts of the world, from diverse backgrounds, 
and on a range of issues that are vital to the world that the youth will inherit. We have heard about inclusive recovery from the pandemic, about achieving the sustainable development goals, creating decent jobs, eradicating hunger and poverty, and building resilient food systems, about making the transition to sustainable patterns of production and consumption, about removing inequalities, inequalities of wealth, gender, race, religion, or origin, and building a system of human interaction that promotes inclusiveness and peace. We have heard about utilizing science and technology, especially the digital space, to build a new world, a peaceful and more prosperous world in which young people clearly aspire to achieve. We have also heard about the perspectives of youth from different regions, from Asia and the Pacific, Africa, Europe, North America, and other states from Latin America and the Caribbean. This 10th anniversary of the Youth Forum has indeed been exceptional. It has affirmed that our endeavors at the United Nations will be designed for and increasingly by and with youth, that no one will be left behind, that the weak and the vulnerable, children, women, the aged and the infirm, will be the first to be protected. I would like to thank all of those who have contributed to the success of this forum. The young people, of course, who brought fresh ideas, brought their ideals, their aspirations and their vision to this discourse. The ministers who took the time to be with us and to listen and to respond to youth. To the major group on children and youth, the International Coordination Meeting of Youth Organizations, the UN Interagency Network on Youth, and especially, of course, the Secretary General's envoy on youth, who has guided the entire forum's proceeding. I would also like to thank the United Nations Department for Economic and Social Affairs and my dear friend, Ambassador Liu Jianmin, the Department of Global Communications, Conference Management, the PCSS, and of course, our interpreters. Thank you all. This has indeed been a successful forum, as we have heard over 19,000 19, young people have participated. Clearly, we need a more intensive and continuing engagement with youth. And I believe that with the recommendations that we have heard from the Secretary General's envoy, we will be intensifying our interaction with youth. So thank you all. To commemorate and celebrate this event, I would now like to invite you to watch the, a closing collage of the diversity of youth who joined and contributed to the success of this forum. Thank you. 
until we meet again, I would wish all of you stay safe and healthy, stay bold and vocal. This Youth Forum of the Economic